Um, some Charlie Brown. You did Charlie Brown? Yeah. We did Home Alone, and that's it. It's very it's been very disappointing. We need to do Muppet Christmas Carol. That's a that's a must. I don't know if my kids have ever seen that. Maybe they saw it one year. We don't have like firm tradition. I feel like Muppet Christmas Carol's trending a little bit right uh, this year on social media. I'm really? seeing a lot of like jokes, and maybe I'm just the Maybe it's just me. But, so your your algorithms. Well, I think dialed I, you in. Yeah, I guess so. But <laughs> I've seen a lot of funny ones just about how Michael Caine was so invested and serious in his role. Yeah, and that's what he does. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's marvelous. So we have to watch that one. We have to watch Klaus, uh, which is my new favorite Christmas movie. I just discovered it two years ago. But what is it? It's an animated uh, Christmas movie about the origin of Santa Claus. Huh. And it's absolutely beautiful. Makes me cry like four times. Nice. But that good, that good cry. Yeah. Yeah. That good cry. Yeah. I'm with you. All right. Okay. I think, I think we're, oh, I don't know if I did a fun fact. Oh, I knew I forgot Well, something. how can we have fun without a fun oh fact? Oh my gosh, I need a fun fact. We do. I did the Christmas lights last time. I bet there's some other thing. No, oh, there are biggest, tallest tree or something like that. Probably. I don't know what would be interesting. All right, well, I've got levels, and well, you've got we're levels. Recording right now. All right. Oh yeah, we've been recording. I'll try to figure out a fun <clears throat> fact. I mean, I totally have this all planned out so well. Definitely, we're definitely advance. not planning this out just minutes before. We wouldn't do that. This is what happens when I mostly get it planned the night before and then i get tired and i run out of steam and i'm like yeah i think it's good enough i'll figure out the rest during the day and then it's all meetings and sounds great oh crap now we're recording yep anyway we'll find a fun fact somewhere in here as we go we will i like your sweater drew thank you this was uh very fuzzy this was it is on the fuzzier side yeah Yeah. i think this was new last year or year before i don't think i got a new one last year yeah Anyway. It's got dogs on it. Yeah. Too bad they're not corgis, but yeah. Well, you know, not everybody can be that cool. It's something. All right. You ready? Yes. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 115 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. And I am Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. We took off last week and we have a lot to talk about, about what happened there. But before we do, in today's show, we're going to be talking about feed fins, what they are and why they are what they are. We're going to talk about the fate of Drew's beloved Ferris Wheel Press buttered popcorn. I begrudgingly do a deep dive about measuring the smoothness of paper and it gets scary and I, it's an interesting experience. There'll be a story to tell. Um, We're gonna talk about what fountain pens are like the Omega Speedmaster of the pen world. So like the watch that all collectors think you should have, what pen kind of falls into that group Uh, and which fountain pens will stand the test of time like 100 year old vintage pens do. Do modern pens still kind of have it in them to do that. And then we're going to be spotlighting the Monte Grappa Elmo Beach. And we have an extra week of what's happening stuff to cover since we were out last week. So it's going to be a good time. And uh, yeah, we'll kick it off with some feedback. Okay, Brian. Kenneth is coming to us today from the world of feedback. And Kenneth says, I love the discussion of perfection. This was in reference to why isn't there a perfect fountain pen? Mm. Um, Kenneth says, I feel perfection is the journey itself of finding your own happiness in finding the pen, ink, and paper in your own fountain pen journey. I'm just glad there is such a positive community as I continue on in my own journey. That's awesome. That is very true. And I agree with Kenneth. And yeah, it really is. I do wonder if maybe out there if someone thinks that they haven't found the perfect pen Mm. to kenneth's point what if they have found the perfect pen they just haven't found the right ink and paper to go with that pen to make it perfect there you go Mm. that's why you're passing in the night that's why you have to try literally everything and every combination and you should try them all from the goulet pen company right (laughs) okay that's a bonus john toledo which with a name like drew brown holy toledo when john toledo comes around you're just like well that's just 
I'm jealous. This is more fun. I gotta be honest. John Toledo. Like that's just I don't know. Like he he he's he's been on a horse before in his life. <laughs> I have I've not a horse. I don't know. He's just like John Toledo. Like he's 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 hmm. he's gone fast on a horse. Hmm. Yeah. Drew Brown, like, what has he done? I don't know. Probably some fountain pen podcast or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, John Toledo, apart from racing horses, says, here's an enhance here's an enhanced converter ink behind the piston. Oh, an enhanced converter ink behind the piston fix. Oh boy. So we talked about using your finger to stop the vacuum pressure while operating a piston uh, cartridge. Suck the ink from the behind the piston seal yeah. on the converter, yeah. So John I, still Tol- I still haven't tried that yet. <laughs> well, here you go, you can, do, you can try two things now because oh. John Toledo says you can use a bulb syringe cut to fit snugly on the converter Okay. Compress the syringe, attach it to the converter, and let that do the work. No oh. finger suction marks, and it provides a continuous vacuum to pull the ink out. But wait, there's more. John says, I first used this concept for an even more irritating problem, ink behind a inner cap. Oh. I couldn't disassemble the cap to clean it, and using the same concept, I pulled the ink from behind the cap liner completely huh. and quickly. It's best to leave it vertical with the cap opening facing downward. So you get gravity working on your side. Yeah. I've never thought to do that. Neither have I. Man, as long as we've been doing this, you'd think we'd have heard of everything. I know, so I'm super excited That's to try cool. this. That's cool. Yeah, so okay. I will be definitely giving that okay. a shot next time that happens, which it will happen, especially. We'll have, like, we'll have to like demonstrate this at some point. Yeah. Because I feel like we've talked about these things Well, last time we Well, last now. time we mentioned the converter trick, we had a bunch of people in the comments say, hey, yeah, I've yeah. done that and it yeah. works. So if anybody has done the same thing, but with a cap, Please let us know. We'd love to have uh, John Toledo's hard work validated. Although I trust him, I don't know what I don't know what it is about him, but I just feel like John Toledo's a trustworthy fellow. I like how he went from being on a horse to racing horses, just in your. Well, I told you there. he's gone fast on a horse, so <laughs> you know he had a purpose. He's not just doing it all willy nilly. John Toledo, the horse racer. Yeah, he's got purpose. So <laughs> Red Moon Venus is rounding us out with feedback today and saying, "You are not alone." Talking to me specifically about my cereal box woes Mm. despite all the efforts my husband and i put towards raising our kids properly (laughs) these three wild animals still forage into cereal boxes (laughs) like they were famished wolverines never a properly opened cardboard box in our pantry just shreds of sorry packages oh man so red moon venus gets it three times three Wow. So you don't have any, you don't have a chance. You don't stand a chance with, with three. Yeah. You're outnumbered. I'm sorry. But wow. yeah, that's, I, I, I do appreciate being seen. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yep. I always know but, before uh, when the cereal box is done, before I like break it down for recycling, got to turn it upside down and see all the little cereal uh-huh. bits all in the, the bottom of the box. Pe- all the stale pieces. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, I bet you what Red Moon Venus is talking about, I'm guessing her kids probably do the thing where you've got that tab at the top of a cardboard box that's mm-hmm. supposed to tuck into the little slit. Yeah. I bet you her kids at some point have taken that tab and just ripped you with the tab and just put a tear right through the middle of the mm-hmm. cardboard oh, flap. Yeah. Oh man. So you can't even close the cardboard. Not like, not like know. now. And I know that closing the cardboard does not seal in air, but no. it, it makes for a more tidy appearance. It keeps like dust and other yeah. like, things in the atmosphere yeah. from Falling and if you had bag. a whole pantry full of like cardboard boxes that were just open and not closed at all, like come on, now that just looks. You know what else upsetting. happens other than the haphazardly open mm-hmm. cereal box is when the bag is not like attempted to be closed or rolled up or anything, and it's basically just like an open bag of cereal sitting inside a flimsy that's, cardboard box, that's and you're crushing. like. This is just going to get stale so fast. Oh, it breaks my heart. That is so depressing. We had a lot of we had a lot what, of people saying that you know we need to just use scissors and tape and, and we had yeah, uh, got to repair at, it. At least one person you know said that they live in a very humid environment and without proper cereal bag storage, you know things get, go get, get soggy very quickly. Interesting. Yeah. 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 So that's why uh, grape nuts are a great cereal, Drew. Don't bring they this back up. We were talking stale. about this earlier today, and this man was trying to be a proponent of grape nuts, and I'm not having it. <clears throat> I'm not currently an avid grape nuts eater, but I definitely have gone through phases where grape nuts is like my primary cereal. I am very upset with you right now. I don't know. And you don't even let it get soggy. You no, eat it's like better a, when it's crunchy. Oh, golly, Brian. I like eating like small pebbles. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's good. Read, read some feedback. 
Okay. Golly. I got some feedback. Ugh. All right. Don Demanda says, I missed you guys last week. You're a bright, shiny, fun video each week. I love the education and learning about your lives. I'm unable to be active right now, but my fountain pens are bringing me joy as you guys are too. Thanks for being awesome. Well, I appreciate that. We try to be awesome every day. Uh, Dayro90 says, excuse me, I've got like a burp that's like stuck in my throat. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> speaking, <laughs> speaking of sticking posters to walls, you can actually put down a rectangular frame of painter's tape to protect the wall. Then you add a layer of double-sided tape on top of the painter's tape. This will hold up the poster and should be easily removed from the wall when you're done without damaging the wall. That's a pretty good idea. That's very clever. That is pretty clever. I added that one because there was a lot of comments beneath that saying that that's a great idea. I that's wish a really I cool that. idea. Yeah. That's a really cool idea. I will say, <clears throat> so not to divulge too much of my what's happening portion, just a little, a little teaser, but I hung a lot of Christmas lights. That was part of my adventures. Um, so in doing so, I was looking at all kinds of command hooks and various A lot of people things. said poster command strips. That's, I discovered I had some of those. Ah, Didn't even realize it. Great. I had some. So I had already hung up Ellie's poster with the blue tacky stuff that crumpled the edges of the poster and I, it's probably not gonna hold. Um, but yeah, the poster strips. So I feel like it's kind of an expensive way to go. So if you're like, covering the room in posters like I feel is going to happen as my kids get more into their teenage years probably but for right now it's like a couple of posters in the room I'm like I can I can swing that but the painter's tape trick is cool because like I have all that stuff already I got a lot of painter's tape yeah it's like a frame for whatever the heck you want to stick to your wall yeah it doesn't even have to be a frame really like it just you, you just, just do corners the, yeah yeah you can just do it wherever you're just putting a, the a tape. barrier yeah between yeah. the drywall and the paper yeah smart smart I like it cool learning things I like how y'all are like our chat GPT. We can just, <laughs> just put stuff out there and eventually get an answer. Um, all right. Uh, Dacia Johnson says, Brian and Drew, this is the second pencast I found. Haven't gone back and listened to past episodes. Oh, so like second of our, our pencast, not like second of all podcasts. Cause I'm like, that's kind of amazing if we're the second one you found at all. Anyway. Um, okay, haven't gone back and listened to past episodes, which I plan to. Brian's comment on cyber insurance made me smile. I work as a finance manager for a technology company. Cyber insurance is a real need and jumped in cost this year. We went through the same cringes when we heard the increase. Kudos to you guys for going through that and thank you for mentioning that. There you go. Yeah, we have had cyber liability insurance for a couple of years and it doubled in price from year one to year two, and then doubled again from year two to year three. And then we shopped around and got a little much cheaper rate. So shop around, it pays to shop around. But anyway, cyber liability insurance is a thing. There's, there's Look no matter it. how random our topics get, there always seems to be at least one person that says, hey, you know that random topic that y'all talked about? I appreciated mm -hmm. that. And, and Drew, it never ceases to amaze me. Drew begrudgingly puts that into the feedback. He's I mean, like, yeah, I hate validating, you know, validating the tangents. My but, obscure tangents. But it is what it is. Things, yeah. I'm not going well, to not gonna try to stifle reality. I feel seen. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. That's it for feedback right now. But uh, we got some new stuff. So let's talk about that. All right. First off, new stuff. This is all going to be kind of new to me, too, because... I was pretty unplugged last week. Yeah, we were both and very unplugged. Some of this was like, some of this we knew was coming and some of it was like announced and then is now here. Yeah, we were like, oh wait, that was last week that came? That came? That yeah. came when we were out? Oh, okay. It's always fun. A lot of things happen. I thought that was here. further away. All right. Yeah, it's fun. It just keeps things fresh. Uh, so for one, new Twisby. Hello, Twisby Eco. Cream with rose gold. This is a nice looking pen, I got to say. Really does look nice. Really. I'm, I'm kind of digging all the Twisby rose golds. I feel like they do a really good job with that. I am... I would say that rose gold for me is 50 50, but the way Twisby pairs it, it's like it 80 really 20. Well. Like yeah. I'm, I'm almost always in favor. You can tell, you can tell they're like it. picking the material to go with rose yes. gold specifically. Yes. It's not just like, oh, here's a material and then eh, I guess we'll put rose gold on it. Because yeah, that's how it goes sometimes. Between you know, this like, one, the jade and rose gold, and the mm -hmm. blue and bronze. Yeah. Like all indigo. three, mm. all three are home runs. Oh, yeah. I still think that jade and rose gold is probably the champ, but. The you think two? so? I like the indigo one. That one's pretty tight. I like it, it, it but does. I like blue. So yeah, I'm a sucker for green and gold, though. It's a good looking yeah. combo. 
I like it too. I have all of these because I like them all and I have a problem. Um, so that is available. Um, same nib breakdown, I believe, extra fine through broad plus stub. I think so. Um, and it is $49.99. So the rose gold Twisbees are a little bit more. I think all of the Ecos are either 50, maybe 60, the Indigo. I can't remember, but um, you're going to pay a little more for those, but still for what you're getting. It's a really, really reasonably priced pen. Um, and then we have the pen that's going to be the spotlight today, the Montegrappa Elmo 01 fountain pen in Beach, which is our exclusive limited edition that we're doing. And yeah, it's a pretty tight looking pen. It's I'm amazing. not going to lie. It looks kind of awesome. I haven't seen anything like it. And no better time to launch a beach themed pen than in December during the holidays. So why not? Anyway, so we'll show you more about that. It's 316, um, but it's Montegrappa's. I'll call it more of their entry level, but their entry is a pretty strong entry. It's a great pen. So um, we'll show you that more in a minute. And then the pen that we talked about a lot and then didn't talk about at all because we ran out of them right away is the Magna Carta Mag 600 with that flex nib, that flex 14K nib. Uh, we had the opportunity not only to restock on some of the black ones, but then we got some exclusives, um, which, Magna Card is not like widely available anyway, but you know, they give us the chance to do one really truly exclusive for us. Um, a red and gold and a green and gold. And they look pretty tight. And it's like, okay, I guess it's sort of holiday themed thing, but like whatever. It's just a good looking yeah. They're good looking colors. Um, and same price, three fifty for those. So same great nib. But if you want something more colorful than plain black, um, same gold trim and everything, um, but you get some very interesting materials like swirly, lots of chatoyants and stuff like that. So um, it'll be a numbered edition. I think we're doing, I don't remember how many we're doing, 50 of each, I think. I don't recall. It'll be on the on the site, on the page. Um, so if you if you do want one of those, get right on it because I, they're not going to be around for probably all that long. The black one sold out pretty fast and they're already moving yeah. quickly. But uh, yeah. hopefully we have enough to last us for a little while, but we'll see. Yep, we'll order more but not of the red and green ones because I think this is a one-shot deal for us. So anyway, uh, that's what we got on that front. Drew, you got some stuff to talk about. Brian, we have a new exclusive Bennu Euphoria. <gasps> and I love I've, those. I've loved all of our refreshment series pens that yeah. we have had in the Euphoria line. Mm -hmm. But this one, I think might be bigger than the ice caramel latte. Whoa. Like it, that's, if, if it's, that's a hot if, take. I'm I don't just know, saying man. if it, if it it's Earl Grey, Brian, and we got, Earl we got, Grey, you, you think Earl Grey, you're like, okay, it's a tea, it's brown. Yeah. Yes, but what Banu did with an Earl Grey theme was they took the translucent brown, which by the way, there aren't many Banu demonstrators out there. Right. Um, this one, I think, is more demonstratory than most of the Banus that I've seen. Yeah, because um, normally there's like a lot of depth in the material. Yeah. But you're not like seeing through. Yeah, seeing through to the. You inside. can see through a good portion of it. However, it's not just transparent brown. It's got a transparent amber to it. Yes, and it's mm -hmm. beautiful. However, they went with the tea and the tea leaf theme. So you got that transparent amber, but then you also have tea leaves in it. Actual tea leaves. They put the actual tea leaves. This in It's like a talisman pen. thing that they usually do. They try yes. to put bits of whatever the thing is, but they did that for the They did it with the Euphoria. There are because they, cool. they tried to do actual sprinkles in the uh um confetti, confetti milkshake. Milk. The actual sprinkles didn't work. But this time yeah. they got the actual tea leaves to work. So there is actual tea leaves from an from Earl Earl Grey tea in these pens. And they have the lavender in there that Earl Grey contains. And they've also got some gold sparkles and some purple. It's a beautiful, beautiful design. It looks really awesome. It's just incredible. I think you're going to love it. So take a look. We'll be showing you pictures right now, but there's plenty more online. It almost looks like a tortoise kind of like material. That yeah, looks, in a way. It's like a vintage -y kind of like amber translucent kind of a thing. It, in a way, it honestly, reminds me of that. Honestly, it looks like tea <clears throat> with tea leaves floating around in it. It's, Bennu really slammed it with this they, one. They did. I was just job. shocked. I knew it was going to be good. I did not know it was going to be this good. So enjoy that. Uh, Sailor is coming out with some more Dipton inks and pens. Uh, it kind of like they did with the Shimmer inks that were released uh, several months ago. They're doing another set of three. However, this time they're not going to be the Hokoro dip pen and a shimmer ink, but it's going to be a Hokoro dip pen and a sheening ink. So we've got three different 
heavy duty sheening inks paired with three Hokuro Fude dip nibs. We've got a uh, black, a green, and a blue. The, well, the dark gray, I guess. Black, it's dark cave is the blackish grayish, literally bluey one. Ripe fig is green, and blue flame is very, very blue. All three, though, have a heavy sheen component, specifically the ripe fig and the blue flame. Now we're talking like up there with nitrogen levels of sheen, like a ton of sheen. And uh, again, Sailor says that these are for dip pens only. A dip ton. So a dip ton of sheen, yes. <laughs> uh, Sailor says that these are for dip pens only. So officially, you are to be using them with the Hokuro dip nib. Unofficially, you know, do with them as you see fit, but uh, don't think that you're going to come complaining to Sailor if uh, something goes wrong. But, uh, you know, we've tested them. It's got a lot of sheen. So, I mean, they're, they're not what I would call low maintenance inks. They've got a lot of stuff in them, but mm -hmm. there's also nitrogen. So, you know, take that for what it is. Mm. So the 20 mil bottle of ink by itself is $24 if you just want those inks. With a smaller volume of ink and the pen, those are $29 and you get them both. So um, the sets are limited, but the bottles themselves are not. So those are available now. Pick them up if you want. And then I've got one more thing to mention, and it is the Voyager. Yes, the Visconti Voyager Mariposa. Uh, those are fountain pens that are going to be selling for $796. The Voyager is a model that we've had before. This one's a bit different, though. It has a new engraved center band, um, and we've got two colors, both done in the U.S. by Jonathan Brooks of the Carolina Pen Company. If you've seen Jonathan's resins before, you know that they're always good. These two are no exceptions. One is Painted Beauty, the other is Malachite. Both look quite lovely. Both are U.S. exclusives. So those were done in coordination with the U.S. distributor of Visconti here in the U.S. and then Jonathan Brooks himself. Those are, um, they've got the 14 karat in-house Visconti nib and they are power filler pens. I believe it's just the single power filller, uh, no ink Not window on those. Reservoir, yeah, yeah, so just the regular power filler, uh, power filler on those. Mm-hmm. Um, they're available now as well. It's just those two colors. And um, they look tight. They do look very nice. So Jonathan doesn't make anything ugly. No, he doesn't. <laughs> that's not his bag. Yeah. All right. That's the new stuff, Brian. You ready for q and I'm more than ready for q and Are you actually ready, though? Not at all, but let's go. <laughs> all right, let's do it. Robert. <laughs> is bringing us the Q&A to kick things off today. Hi, Robert. Robert says, hi, guys. Hi. Hi, Robert. What do ribs do on feeds besides break? Ha! Um, it seems most pen feeds have horizontal ribs, but n some have none. Example, Lamy, Platinum Preppy. Mm -hmm. And my Diplomat Magnum has vertical ribs. Mm. How can something on the underside of the feed change the ink flow down the nib on the top? How do designers figure out what's best? And why aren't they different for different nib sizes that have different ink flow requirements? Hmm. Have you ever heard them called ribs before? No, this is new. Because I have not. This is new. But I it kind of makes them, sense. Yeah. yeah. I call them fins. I say fins. But... Ribs makes just as much sense. You, it's ribbed. What about baffles? You know, baffles, they're sure. Not, kind of. They're not enclosed. Baffles are always enclosed, aren't they? Um, it's a good question. I don't know if baffles are required to be enclosed to be considered baffles. I like that word. Baffle. That's a fun word. It is a good word. Why anyway. is it baffle? But if you change the B to a W, it's waffle. <laughs> Why isn't it waffle or baffle? I don't know. These are the questions we should be answering. This is a Goulet family <laughs> dinner conversation that happens right here. My kids bring these kinds of things up all the time. See, me and Archer would talk about this, and Shannon would have exactly 15 seconds before she told us to shut up and talk about something else. <laughs> she has no patience for nonsense talk. Oh, man. She come to our house. This is like the entire dinner conversation is stuff like this. She, she'll, she'll entertain it for a little while, but once it gets to be really dumb, she's like, no, nope, mm, stop. I bet that doesn't take long. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's talk about feeds, right? Um, so there's basically one function of a feed, right? <clears throat> Fountain pens, as Richard Bender has famously said, and I love his phraseology of it, fountain pens are just a controlled leak. 
Um, and the feed is really what is controlling that leak. So there's air that has to flow into the ink chamber as the ink is flowing down the feed and then onto the nib and onto the paper. So the feed and the overall feed design, there's some aesthetic to it, but ultimately the function of it is it has to have the right balance of ink flow and air interchange. If you have too much air going in, then the ink is going to just dump out of the pen. If you don't have enough, the ink is not gonna wanna come out of the pen, it's gonna be stingy and it's not gonna write. So it's, it's a very, very fine balance that's measured in like hundreds and thousands of whatever. My favorite analogy me is- Millimeters and these types of things. My favorite analogy is when you have a straw in water and you plug the top of the straw, pull yep. it out of the water, you've still got straw in there. Exactly. And nothing drips out. Yep unless you touch it to like a paper towel. Mm -hmm. If you touch it to paper towel, the whole thing like just yeah, soaks it up. Yeah, because and air is going into the end of the straw as the water's flowing out of mm -hmm. it, right? That's essentially the basic principle behind what's happening in a fountain pen. So it's that surface tension of the water that's allowing the process of capillary action to allow it to flow through the feed. So the feed in the part that you can't see, the mm -hmm. underside, the, the, the top of the, uh, the top side of the feed that mates up to the underside of the nib, so that's completely out of view, that has what's called the feed channel. That's where your ink is actually flowing through. So from the ink reservoir, it's then flowing through that channel in the feed, and then it's mating up to the back of the nib, yeah. and it flows down the slit of the nib, and that's that's the delivery system that's happening. It's common to see an ink channel on top of the nib and then an air channel below the nib. Yes. Most, yeah, there's a lot of different designs to yeah, different feeds. Yeah, not always, but. But most fountain pens, I would say, you're going to have the air, and, and thus when you're filling the pen too, it's going to be filling through that filler hole that's on the underside of the feed, and then it's flowing out of the part that you can't see, which mates up to the back of the nib. So that is actually the thing that is is more or less controlling how much ink Definitely is, the most is being delivered to the parts. nib. Yeah, it's not necessarily the fins, which is why you look to answer kind of one part of your question, you look at things like Lamy or the Preppy, or, you know, there's a number of different pens that I'm trying to recall off the top of my head, but I can't. There's a number of different pens that don't have any fins. Falcon. Pilot Falcon, yep, M90. That one comes to mind. Um, uh, the uh, Metro, the Prera, those have yeah, um, they, yeah. They have, have like are, they have like you know four little lines on the underside of the feed, but they're definitely not fins. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty smooth under there. It's so, just a design thing. Um, nothing. Yeah, not to say that it doesn't do anything, but I think what happened basically the basic principle behind why you have those fins or ribs, as you're calling them, is it acts like uh, kind of an extra reservoir for ink that's like really close right up near the nib. So you have the ink you know, inside the pen, that's your main ink reservoir. But the ink can only flow through that very, very small ink channel at such a rate, how whatever it's designed to be. So when you're writing with a really heavy hand or really fast, or you have a really absorbent paper and it's demanding more of ink, the pens that are designed to have those extra fins essentially hold on to extra ink that's not necessarily being poured onto the page, but because you have all those really thin areas there uh, in between those fins, that is helping to hold water there through the water's surface tension. It's not dumping it and delivering it out, but it's just it's just hanging out there so that when you write faster and have more demanding strokes, the ink is right there ready to go. And it just allows for a more consistent, smoother, like ink flowing experience. And then it flows down the ink channel. So it, it acts sort of like as a reservoir type system. Or a regulator in a lot of ways. A if, regulator, if, yeah, that's if, a good way if, to if you've got describe too, it. If you've got too much flow, you either, if you didn't have those there to catch anything, mm -hmm. um, then it's just going to go right onto the paper and you're going to have inconsistent flow. Yeah. If you've ever had to prime your feed, if you've had a very, very dry pen and you just want to kind of eject a little bit from your converter to you know flood your feed, you'll probably notice that's often when you see those fins really saturated. Most of the time, it's not visibly evident when they're saturated. There might be a little bit there, but you can really see the fins at work if you do like force ink into your feed mm -hmm. because you're gonna overdo it because that's not the natural state of the ink flow. Right. But when you do that, 
you're more the, those feeds are more than likely able to catch that excess ink that you're ejecting mm -hmm. yeah. um, because that's just what they're meant to do. They're meant to like catch that extra ink. And unless you're pouring out a ton, they're going to do a pretty good job at that. And mm -hmm. I've seen that happen before where I've, you know, filled my pen. My feed is super saturated because yeah. I just dipped it and I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that like that feed, those fins are totally like full. Soaking so wet. Yeah. I'll be like, oh crap, I need to go and just blot it on some paper. Uh -huh. And I'll do that. But if those fins weren't there, mm -hmm. then that blob would have ended up on my paper. Right, exactly. Exactly. So it's giving you extra, like you said, kind of a, a regulator. So making sure you don't get too much, making sure you don't get too little. Um, but, you know, why isn't it like that on every single pen? Well, we quickly get to like a place of scientific like design kind of stuff that is above my pay grade. Like I don't understand all of the specific science behind feed design. And a lot of it too, honestly, is kind of trade secret and stuff like that. So I, I only have but so much access to the knowledge. Um, but you can look at like old patents and stuff of different feed designs if you're really interested in seeing kind of how these things work. Um, but there's so many multitudes of feed designs, but essentially they're all trying to do the same thing, just regulate that ink flow. Um, you certainly don't I, have to have them though. Um, there are some that don't have them and there's some that true. if they break off, your pen will still function just fine. Oh yeah, it's true. You're just gonna miss, you know, that bonus feature of, yeah. you know, having that ink regulation outside of the pen when you dip or anything like well, that. Well, one thing I will say is if you take up, like using Lamy as an example, um, I don't know if we have any images of a disassembled Lamy feed to share here, but yep. I, I believe I've talked about this in previous videos. You have, and someone else wrote in a question to ask why it has that. So yeah, the, the Lamy- Which I don't, I can't The Lamy that. feeds are in like two parts basically. So if you, it's got the feed channel, but it's like, it's, it's almost like enclosed. So it's got this one little thin part on top. If you pull the feed out of a Lamy pen, you can like unlatch like part of the, the feed and it shows you then the ink channel that's in there. But then you can see it's got a bunch of fins internally that I think are doing the same thing. So they don't have external fins because they have internal fins. So I think pretty much most fountain pens are gonna have those fins somewhere. Yeah, I think a lot of them have it's both. It's a matter of can, yeah, it's a yeah. matter of can you see them or can you not? Yeah, most of them, like if you look at your standard Yovo feeds, you know, you've oh, yeah, got yeah. them both in and out. Yeah, absolutely. And so those Yovo feed, that, that's like, those things are like all fin. Yeah, they're just, and Pelican has like fins for days. You know, like an M1000, it's just like all fins. Yeah. Um, and they do a really good job of catching a ton of ink. So um, yeah, that's basically that's basically what it's all about. So I'm um, trying to think if there's anything else. And maybe maybe one day we can have somebody smarter than us uh, yeah. come in and talk about how, feeds. We can get yeah, how do the designers figure out what's best? You asked about that. I have no idea. They are really good at what they do and they probably honestly, I mean, feed designs and patents go back to like the very beginning of fountain pen technology. So you're like 150 years probably. Um, and there's probably just a zillion of designs that have come out and it's trial and error with a lot of science and that that's kind of how it works. And there are a couple designers that have designed their own feeds. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't sure. know if you, if you see, uh, Ian shown at a pen show, maybe you can ask him, <laughs> but yeah. we, yeah. we haven't yet done that. So yeah, that's uh, be, maybe he would share some, Perhaps you know, he probably doesn't have like as much of a stake in the trade secrets of feed design. No, no, he's, he's very you know? transparent about yeah. his design work, but no. uh, yeah, we'll see. So anyway, but um, the last thing you asked about here is like, do they have different ink flow requirements for different nib sizes? And the answer is like, yes and no. This is something that like, we've talked to like Philip at Twisby. And he says like for the extra fine and fine nibs, they can use the same feed. And the like medium and broad and stubs use a different one. So if you are nib swapping and stuff like that, there's gonna be a, it's, you can't even see it with your naked eye, nor is it labeled or anything <clears throat> like that. But he says it does kind of make a difference. And we didn't, and he had been doing this at Twisby for a long time before we knew that that was happening. Oh yeah, we so, just, it came up and we were asking him like, and he's like, oh yeah, I, I, I do that. And we're like, wait, what, really? Yeah. We had no idea. So, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's something that a lot of other manufacturers are doing. Exactly. They're just like, and honestly, when we ask them up, they're just like, why do you even care? Like, why do you want to know? <laughs> you know, because it's like so nerdy to get into this stuff, but you know, it kind of, is cool. I don't know. It helps to know, I guess, but ultimately you just like watch your pen work. But, yeah. So yes, I know it happens, but I don't know like 
I don't think it's like every nib size has its own feed. I'm sure there's some variability and flexibility in there. I believe Magna Carta does it a bit, but they've got a crazy variety in their pens offerings. Yeah. So it's not like it's there's one universal feed for everything anyway, because right. he, he makes his own feeds. Well, and two, I know with Ebonite, like I'm thinking about like Noodler's pens, they don't have as much of the fins, but because it's Ebonite, that material itself is a little more forgiving. Mm -hmm. So the fin structure doesn't need to be quite the same. So there's a lot of factors that go into it and basically we're not a pen manufacturer, so we don't have to figure all that stuff out <laughs> because it's really complicated. Thankfully. All right. Drew, I got a question for you. Yeah. From Dan. Hey, Dan. Dan says, I just ordered a couple of samples of Ferris Wheel Press buttered popcorn. Hey, oh, based on the amount of sight, <clears throat> based on the amount of excitement that Drew has spoken about this with double preposition, but was sad to see that there are no bottles of it available. Drew, it's your fault. It feels like a repeat of my sadness in trying a sample of Pelican Golden Barrel, enjoying it and finding out it was a limited edition. So was not available by the time that I tried it. And looking at the Ferris Wheel Press lineup, I feel like there are way fewer colors available than the amount of colors that I have heard mentioned on the pen cast. So Drew, why are you a liar is what he's saying. Not really. Um, I know they have several product lines, but can you provide any information to explain when we can tell what inks are limited in nature and what ones might be available for an extended period? Well, explain yourself. let me first say, yes, Golden Barrel <laughs> was popular. It went away. Uh, Diamond Golden Sands is a great alternative, as is oh, Robert Oster one. Aussie liquid gold. Those are both. Those are both fantastic. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let me then say that we're going to pour one out for buttered popcorn mm. because. Oh, it's okay, Drew. Okay. It's okay. Hang on. Hang on. You can do it. You can do it. Uh, buttered. Mm. Buttered popcorn has at this point. It's really dusty in here. It's uh, dust in his eyes. Yeah. Been discontinued <gasps> by the manufacturer. Oh no. Oh, okay. Um do they know that how much you love that ink drill? They do. Are they aware? They are. And they're um, okay just breaking your heart. Yeah. Basically. Whew. All right. Uh butter popcorn is being discontinued because I don't know. Um because it's a yellow ink. The best selling yellow ink that we've had all year, Brian. Yeah. Goulet, if that is your name. Sure. Yeah, it is. Um, so, yeah, that's why you can't find it. Uh, admittedly, it's yellow ink. it was. Yeah, I know. <laughs> admittedly, it was uh, selling out, you know, for a little bit after I wouldn't shut up about it. But now it's selling out because we can't get any more. So yeah. I'm sorry. You'll have to go back to using Roaring Klinger Helianthus like I will be doing. Jerobon. So, Amber de Bermani is nice. Amber de Bermani? Well. Amber de Bermani. Yeah. Yep. That's fine. It's not buttered popcorn, though. It's not, but, you know, <sighs> it's still fun to say. So that's <laughs> tremendously upsetting. Um, but in regards to Ferris Wheel Press as a whole and knowing what's going to stick around and what's not going to stick around, the ones that are definitively not going to stick around are a, are sometimes easy to tell. So Ferris Wheel Press does do a good job in mentioning its annual limited edition inks. So 2022 brought us Roaring Patina Black, 2023 was the Fluttering Heart, and then now for 2024, they have already released uh, Blue Crystal, Crystal, Blue, Crystal Legacy. Blue Legacy. Yeah. So those are there, those are in the title of the product. It'll say 2024 limited edition. Just so, like Pelican is their ink of the year. Yes. Like Golden, like Barrel. Golden Barrel. Yes. So you know those are going to be limited in offering, you know, sticking around for about a year. They will make more throughout the year, but then once the beginning of the next year shows up, like right now we're in December and they've already come out with 2024, you know, they'll do the same thing. So those you know are not going to be sticking around. The other ones you know that are probably not going to be sticking around are the fairy tales inks. So those are the little ones and the little balls, not the big flat, you know, uh, perfume bottle looking things. So the fairy tales inks, which always have the crazy colors like, you know, uh, you know, um, poison, po envy, poison and envy, yeah, sugar and spite. The, yep. um, so those are, from what I understand, produced in one batch and they just sell that one batch. It's a large batch mm -hmm. from 
what I can gather. And then once that has completely sold out, they're it's done. Right. Yeah. However, we've been surprised at times that we were able to reorder on those farther along than we thought we'd be able to. So I can't really put a finger on whether or not they have made multiple batches of them. I have, so I have theories. Again, we're not like, we don't have anything to do with the manufacturer of these inks. Like we are a retailer, we buy it from them, we sell it to you all. Um, we try to have good relations and stuff like that. But like in terms of quantities of specific things produced in their production schedule and stuff, we don't usually get that level of detail of information from most of our manufacturers unless we're doing like an exclusive or something like that. Um, but what happens with these types of like single batch type things, because we've done this ourselves with even like some of our Sailor and Northern Lights pens and stuff like that that we've done in the past, you know, we will have it in a single batch. And if it doesn't sell well, we'll have it for a really long time because nobody's buying it. But if it sells really well, then we'll be like, oh, well, we can reorder it, but there's minimums you have to meet to reorder it. So if the demand is really high and we feel like we can sell another round of it and we have the availability to do that, we'll get another round of it. And guess what? It'll be available longer. But if it falls somewhere in the middle to where it doesn't blow it out and then you reorder and it just continues to sell like gangbusters, but it doesn't like trickle on for years and years, if it's popular enough to, to not drag on forever, but not so popular that it's worth reordering, that's where you end up with situations like buttered popcorn, where they probably did a batch of it. They probably didn't have enough demand to continue doing more batches of it. They've, they've had butter popcorn for years, though. Have they? They have uh, they have butter popcorn since they made the giant grenade-shaped bottles. Hmm. So maybe this probably isn't the original batch no. then. No, it's definitely not. Okay. Like I have oh. a butter, my butter popcorn is in one of the old school. Like, oh, really? You got a big old, yeah. big one. Yeah. Because they had like the, like the, like the smaller orb ones, but no, bigger. Yeah. The ones that came. like that design. The one like that came in, in the bag. It came yeah. in like a velvet bag. Yeah. I have some old, old ones like that. Yeah. My, they that's one make mine those any? They don't make those anymore, no. do they? No. They changed the bottle. So they've the been doing fun. butter popcorn for a while. Okay. If you remember when we first carried Ferris Wheel Press, somebody really wanted to carry buttered popcorn in our initial offering, but uh, right. no one listened to him. So he had to stop. He had to keep talking about it. It's true. You know, so I don't know. But now knowing the fate, it would have may, just... May, knowing the fate, we should have gotten started sooner. It would have just sold out that much quicker oh. and died that much earlier. I don't know. Would anyway. a difference? Fairy Tales Inc.'s usually going to sell out pretty quick. Um, yeah. But to be perfectly honest, sometimes we are also surprised that we can no longer order a certain Many Ferris times. wheel. <laughs> Many times. <laughs> We are very surprised. Many times we go to reorder something and find out that we can no longer reorder it. So, Because keep in mind, like not, not knocking on Ferris Wheel Press or any of our manufacturers, they got a lot going on. We are one of, I don't even know how many retailers that they sell through. Plus they sell on their own website. They can't keep track of the sales rate of every single individual product. And who knows, they might have had more of this on order. There might have been something at the factory. They had a problem with it. They had whatever. They may have planned to continue to reorder it, but hit a snag and now they can't get it. And by the time they find all that out, they've sold through most of their stock. And guess what? Retailers go to reorder it and they're like, we don't have any more. We can't get it. It's now discontinued. That happens all the time yeah. in the retail world. We often don't find out about things being discontinued until we go to reorder it like normal. And they're like, yeah, we don't have any more. And we're, we don't know if we're going to get any more, blah, 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 blah. And then we find out eventually like, okay, this is it. It's discontinued now. And we're like, great. We and have broads left yeah. and that's it. So do we announce that it's discontinued? Do we not? Do we, da, da, da. It's hard and to Ferris Wheel Press is a little bit differently because they definitely do have a marketing focus on new limited edition inks. Sure. They like to, you know, create new stuff very, very frequently. Their launch schedule is for any company leagues and leagues leagues and bounds leagues and bounds leagues ahead leaps and bounds ahead That's of right. any other ink brand as far as their release schedule so they are going to probably drop more off their line at a greater rate than other ink brands just yeah. kind of that's just kind of their strategy but to be fair i looked on their website they really don't use the word limited edition. No, they don't. Pretty much anywhere. No. So to even know, and you look at their website, they have a lot of stuff that's out of stock and says sold out. Yeah. But it's not clear if they're going to have any more of it or whatever. So 
your guess is kind of as good as ours. Yeah, that's really sometimes. the short answer. I hate to say that. Maybe we can try to like ask them about this kind of stuff and nail down more specifics or for sure there's times, not even just with Ferris World Press, but there's probably times where we could do a better job of keeping our product pages on our websites up to date if we know something's being discontinued, but it's not yet. I will say it's hard to keep track of 6,000 different SKUs and the all the stuff we, you know, we deal with like 50, 60 different suppliers that can get very complicated in terms of trying to keep up with all the different ins and outs of specific products and which ones are going to be available for how long and all that kind of stuff. So we try to do as good a job as we can of that. It's it's kind of difficult to, yeah. to do that a lot of times. So it is unfortunate with such a beloved color like this. And to give you credit, we did reach out about continuing it. We were like, hey, what if we just did butter popcorn? What's the minimum quantities? And they were like, infinity and we're like we can't afford infinity <laughs> they didn't really say infinity but it might as well have been we did the math on it and it was like oh this is gonna be like a five-year supply or something crazy we were like there's no way even it being as popular yellow as it is there's no way this makes any like sense like you said us. it's still yellow like it, it, it if it didn't make sense for them <laughs> as the manufacturer to sell through all their, all their retailers it's probably not gonna make sense for just us as one retailer to be the sole people carrying that ink but <gasps> It's a very sad reality. But hey, you never know. If a groundswell of interest comes up and they, I'm not going to say go pester them because that's not the right thing to do. But who knows? If you feel so inclined, if there's a groundswell of interest in this ink and the demand is there, I'm sure they're not uh, uh, ideologically opposed to carrying it again. But it's hard. Yellow inks as a whole are just not nearly as popular as any other ink color. Yeah. Okay, let's move on, Brian. Okay, oh. sorry. Thank you, Drew, for powering through that question. Oh my gosh. And then we lead right into the one about the paper smoothness. Yeah, you've, I'm sorry. you've done something bad. Your soul is going to die oh gosh. on this question, Drew. All right, well, everybody can blame Dawn for this because Dawn says, have <sighs> all the questions about pens been answered? No, Dawn, you, you should would, have asked about pens. You would think so. Anyway, <laughs> Dawn goes on to say, if so, here's a question about paper. Is oh, there boy. a way to objectively define or measure smoothness of paper? And yes. it wouldn't hurt to review paper weight measurement. Oh, I Dawn, didn't. did you ask for a thousand pages of Brian's notes? Because I did a deep dive. Yeah, uh, that's what you're going to get. I did a deep dive and I knew getting into it that this was going to be a deep dive. But <sighs> what ended up happening was this was, you know, sometimes when I do these deep dives, I feel sort of like a spelunker. Don't who's deep going, dive on deep dives. Who's like going into a cave. Oh my God. And I'm usually like, I don't know exactly where this cave is going to go, but I know it's got to end somewhere. I may not choose to go all the way down into the cave, but you know, I can feel my way around. This cave, I feel like just opened up into the abyss and I was like hanging by my tether to the surface. And I was just free floating in the darkness. Like, where is the bottom? Where are the walls? There's nothing to grab onto. I can't tell what's happening. It was very scary. About paperweight measurement? Yeah. This is where I was like, oh, here's this little hole in the desert. That's what it seems like. Let me poke like. my head down into it. Oh, no. I'm sure I'll see some things that I'll sort of recognize. Into the crevasse. Into the crevasse. Sure, I'll crawl down into the crevasse. This crevasse had no end to it. Um, so I will warn you, if you're going to research this, it gets very technical, very fast. I'm talking like first entry on Google was like an academic paper with measurements in terms and formulas that I didn't recognize or understand. And I usually try to broaden my knowledge and at least get a basic understanding of what's happening. And I feel like I had a difficult time doing that with all this. And I spent probably a solid hour and a half researching this stuff. Reading Spending an hour and a half on the preamble of academic, this question. Academic papers, I am. Because uh, it's because I'm afraid to get into the meat of the answer. Oh. Um, I even watched a YouTube video from somebody in the industry explaining these different types of tests that they do. And it was so boring. <laughs> oh, so boring. 
Oh, anyway. You told me about this. You said, how many views did this video have? 70. <laughs> 70 views on this five month old video. All it was, right. It was a 26 minute video. Man. <clears throat> it was like a part one too. So it's, oh, who God. knows? Um, anyway, so to answer some of the basics, I didn't even get into paperweight measurement. I didn't prepare anything for that. I was so spent mentally by the time I researched what I did for this question. I didn't even remember you asked that until Drew just read it again right now. And I'm like, paperweight measurement is grams per square meter. If you had a square meter of paper, that's how much it would weigh. Yeah. There you go. All right. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> There's also pound weight, which is different. It's, it, we don't use that. That's a whole other deep dive that I can't, I can't, you cannot do this to me. You cannot couple two <laughs> questions like this together. Someone, oh. someone else had the audacity to ask questions like, what's one pen you couldn't live, live without? Don't overcomplicate it. I just want to know one pen. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to answer this one. Yeah. Don't overcomplicate Don't overcomplicate it. it. I can overcomplicate anything. It's like what a do you, gift. What do, you, what do you do? Have you not watched one of these it's before? It's like a gift that I have. Come on. Um, anyway. Okay. Smoothness of paper. The very short answer to your question is yes. There is a way to objectively define and measure the smoothness of paper. However... It's complicated. It's complicated to calculate. It's complicated to measure. And even the final measurement, I didn't even understand the, the units that they were measuring. I didn't even understand like how to interpret what the final output was from these tests. You know what I do to put to gauge smoothness? Yeah. Put my face on it. I mean, that's not an objective way, but it's a subjective way. Yeah, that's, that's feel like that's the best way I can measure. Okay. This. Yeah. Yeah. Put my face on it. You would think it's paper. You just like it's smooth. You can like feel it with your fingers. Like how smooth does that feel? Or okay. Your face. But if you're talking about objectively measuring, the problem with objectively measuring something like paper smoothness is it's very very small what you're trying to measure it's like imagine a topographical landscape like mountains and hills and valleys and mm -hmm. stuff like that if you go zoom in close enough on a piece of paper that's what gives you smoothness or texture roughness is hills and valleys undulations on the surface of paper oh undulations yeah you like that i do i like that word. i kind of do i also kind of don't because andrej sapkowski the writer of the Witcher books. Okay. Use that word a lot in his books. Really? It's a use, fun word to use. Yeah, but he used it when he's describing like nasty monsters and stuff. Oh. Like undulating tentacles and like eyeball bulgy. Mm -hmm. Like there's, you know, oh. yeah, it wasn't pleasant. I don't, something shouldn't undulate. I'm wondering if undulating doesn't mean like going up and down. Yeah, like I think it could also mean like changing in texture. It could also mean like, texture? it could also, I think, mean like kind of pulsing or pulsing oh like maybe i don't fully understand if, what that no word no means. going up and down it makes sense yeah? like but okay. like if something's like breathing you know that's undulating yeah oh. or throbbing i don't know Ugh, whatever your paper's not throbbing but no but whatever uh so like a record needle then yes so exactly. like so we just like just, vinyl record has so you could put a piece bumps. of paper on a record player and listen to it and be like all right this is very smooth this is not smooth uh, so one of the forms of tests that they do is in effect similar to that. It's sort of like a scratch test. Listen to me. But it uses like a diamond tip with the scratch thing. The, pro the problem, and this is where I, <laughs> uh, this is where it got so deep and so scary. Even with a scratch test, literally the pressure from the thing that's used to make the scratch will change the measurement because it will compress the paper as it's dragging. So you only do it once. So it's only certain types of papers and certain scenarios made of certain fibers and da da blah, 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 blah. Very specific scenarios where that type of test is acceptable or accurate. And of course that has its own units of measurement. Whereas there's other types of tests, some which involve lasers, bouncing laser light off of the paper and measuring <clears throat> things that I don't even understand enough to explain. To, to get a sense of how basically rough or smooth the texture of the paper is. That's its own whole other process and whole other ways of measuring. And then the other one, I guess the more, more common one is the Beck smoothness test, which uses air. It like has paper on a plate and it blows air somehow, which then measures how the air moves between the texture of the, 
I don't even know. I spent so much time trying to understand these things. I couldn't even understand what these tests really did. But I know that but there's- they, But they are, they do exist. There's a number of different tests. And everything I was reading was like, it's really complicated. Doing these tests give you varying like measurements depending on the test. So there's no one test you can do for all types of paper. So just from what I was researching it, and I'm not a researcher, I'm not this like I'm so far outside of my comfort zone, even trying to research this. And I normally am not afraid to go down the hole, but this was a scary, scary hole. Um, it's basically just so complicated and hard to make like layman terms sense that it's like not even worth it to try to measure it. So I was just like, what's the dumb version? Like I just, you know, what can I just like drag something across and measure, you know, like there's gotta be something that measures it for like our types of purposes, but it's, that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be very complicated and scientific and probably very expensive to measure these things. So it just isn't worth it for most scenarios. From what I was reading, the only reason you do these types of tests is because it can make a difference in terms of printing. So if you're talking about newsprint and you know uh, copy printer paper, that type of thing, um, it can matter in terms of the way that the ink bonds to the paper and stuff like that. I cannot imagine in any scenario that fountain pen ink usage would be anywhere near enough on the scale to matter doing this level of testing. Uh, so it would be unreasonably expensive to do it for the purposes of just us having some kind of measurement to say how smooth the paper is. So I think we're forever going to be bound to subjective, you know, summaries of how smooth the paper is. But it definitely got my wheels turning in terms of like, what could we do to better explain or express something about how smooth the paper is? Going this route was certainly not the way to do it though. Um, so just because I did a bunch of research, I'll just look at my notes because this has all just been off the top of my head. So ISO, which is the International Organization for Standardization, which I think is funny because this should be IOS, but they yep. call it ISO. So even the Organization for Standardization is not standardized in their own acronym, uh, which is funny. Um, but they speak about several methods of testing for this. And they say that there isn't one standard of measurement that works for all papers. So that's fun. So the Organization for Standards says there's no standard. Says there's no standard well, okay. for all papers, yeah. Um, ISO talks about the Benston roughness tests, the Sheffield roughness tests, the Beck smoothness tests, among others. Um, I started to deep dive and actually started going cross-eyed from trying to research it um, because it was so incredibly technical and was way over my head. Uh, summary, there are different tests for different, uh, different test methods to measure paper smoothness which vary in their usefulness depending on the type of wood pulp, the coating being used, the thickness of paper, et cetera. Basically, there's no one test that covers everything and often multiple tests need to be done to get a proper measurement. So there you go. Oh, I have a little bit about the Beck smoothness thing, the air thing. So a measure of paper to smoothness is made using an air leak tester. That's what it is, which determines the time it takes for a volume of air to seep between a smooth glass plate and the paper sample. Sh sure. <laughs> Beck smoothness test, the Gurley smoothness tester is another one. Benston Sheffield. I just like, I was like, what is even happening? Trying to Google this. That's kind of this is like right this was like page one Google <clears throat> results. I tried wording it differently. I tried all these different things, and I was like, okay. I give a bottom line: measuring smoothness of paper is objectively possible, but it sounds pretty darn complicated. And I don't think it is justifiable for as niche use of fountain pens. We'll probably be stuck with subjective ratings for the foreseeable future. There you go. And Whew. I have a lot of links to a lot of things. Oh, it's so it's so. This one really threw me. This was like, I found my, I found my limit for what I can handle on a deep dive. And there you go. So I'm tired just even thinking about this anymore. I'm sorry you went so, so far. No, I really enjoy like, like doing this stuff, but I've, I very rarely get like this lost. You know that Linkin Park <laughs> song, like in the end? <laughs> yeah. You know, it doesn't I'm, even matter. I, yeah. yeah. I, I, tried, it feels like I that. tried so hard I tried and so got hard, so far. Got so far. In the end, it didn't even matter. <laughs> Very fitting, Drew. Yes. It's a good way to describe <laughs> my attempt at answering this question. Uh, however, I know we have people smarter than me out there. If you know anything more about this and you can explain it in a way that makes any sense, 
please comment or <laughs> shoot us, an, is. Shoot us an email. I, I hesitate to even ask because I kind of don't want to ever talk about this again. <laughs> But I kind of am interested because it is something we get asked about. And honestly, like the end goal of like having something simple to say how smooth or rough a paper is, that's a noble goal and something I personally would be interested in. So I could look at a given notebook, a given paper and see how smooth the paper is. That would be nice. I get it. I want that. But I don't want to go through this to get it. So I don't know what to do with that. If I come across a better way to do it that's simpler and doesn't scare me, then I'll look into it. But as of right now, this is the best I know and it's scary. All right. Well, thank you for that yeah. valiant effort. I will say, I talked to Micah over lunch. It's part of why I was late coming here. Mm -hmm. um, he was like, why don't you like run it through chat GPT and ask them to summarize it for you in a way that makes sense. And I was like, ah, I never thought of that. So I haven't had time to do that as of this recording. So maybe I'll try that and see if, if I come up with a revelation, All right. uh, I'll come back next week with a follow-up. But AI assisted deep dive. I can't <clears throat> promise I'm going to ever want to think about this again. Okay. All right. Now, on to the next question. Drew, this is from Wade. Hello, Brian and Drew. As a longtime watch collector, I'm enjoying my new obsession, fountain pens. Hey, you are not the first person. Welcome. Here you will save money. Enjoy both watches and pens, yeah. Uh, in the watch collecting world, the Omega Speedmaster Professional is a watch that has a place in every collection. The Speedy is not outrageously expensive in watch collecting terms, which is an important caveat. Yes. Um, but it's a timepiece that even the most sophisticated collector would give the nod of approval to. It's the watch most recommended to new collectors. Is there a fountain pen that you feel fits this description? I look forward to your pen cast every week. Are you familiar with this watch? No, you know? but I did look it up just to find out like where in terms of watchdom it lies. And it's about a $5,000 watch. I've, I've heard that that's like kind of the entry point for watch collecting, which is like so far outside of my realm yes. that I'm like, okay, sure. I'll just take a word for it. Yeah. I, Watches so, get out of control so real quick. <laughs> I suppose that if... $5,000 is kind of like, you know, a nice watch, but, you know, still within the collector's own. I would expect that in a fountain pen world, we're probably looking at like, you know, $300 range. I'm seeing some Speedmasters for like 3,500, five grand, four grand. Yeah. So that's up there. It, the it, five grand fountain pen would be very much in the upper, upper, upper oh, end. Yeah, yeah so definitely. I'll say that, um, so th this, it didn't mention like a universally like appreciated question here. What what Wade says here is that um, a nod of approval. So I'm going to go with that specifically because I don't think there is one fountain pen that just every collector universally loves. They're, they're, I've yeah, heard um, complaints about everything. I don't think there's so, like as much of a collector <clears throat> like market or community that's as focused as like watches. Watches, I feel like it's much more defined as to what is collectible and what's not. Fountain pens, I feel like is way more just kind of wide open. Like you have fountain pens that can get expensive, but I don't think people are buying them and selling them as like kind of investments and stuff like you do in the watch world. I don't think so. Probably yeah. not. So I'm still, I'm not, I'm not in the watch world, so I wouldn't know. I definitely I know enough don't be, have- I know enough to be dangerous. But my most expensive yeah. watch is $300. Um, but I will say that um, the w some pens that a sophisticated collector would give the nod of approval to, I think that we can get there. Yeah, that's the spirit of the question. Yeah, so right? um, thinking about that, um, I would say that the Lamy 2000 is the first thing that pops into my mind. Mm -hmm. The Lamy 2000 has a lot of people who do not like the pen. They do not like the way it looks or they think it's overrated. So that happens. I'm sure the Speedmaster has that, those people too. However, I think that even those people would nod in approval of its impact to the industry and its ongoing appreciation within the community. So mm -hmm. I think about, you know, I would say the vanishing point, the pilot vanishing point as well. Both of those two pens have been around since the 60s and, you know, the Lobby 2000 virtually identical, the vanishing point or the capless the internals are identical. Like the, mm -hmm. the the business end, that's pretty much the same as it always has been. The yeah. externals have changed a bit. Yeah. But overall, they've they've stood the test of time. And I think that even someone who did not prefer them aesthetically or functionally would still nod 
in approval and saying like, hey, these are good pens. Yeah. Maybe not my pens. Like someone might not like the Beatles, but even if they're not your type of music, you're going to know people that know more about music than you do. And they like the Beatles and you're going to look around and be like, well, everybody else likes the Beatles. So just because I don't like the Beatles doesn't mean that they're bad. Right. Like clearly they're good. Yeah. So you know, they're just not my thing. I think that that any, acknowledged in exactly. So world, even if yeah. the capitalist or the 2000 might not be one person's thing, I think they would look at the capitalist and the 2000 and nod in approval saying like, these are objectively good fountain pens. Yeah. Because if they were not, they would not be around for, you know, half a century. Yeah. So the 2000 and the vanishing point I think it'd be hard to dispute that they would mm -hmm. not get the nod of approval from most collectors. There's probably a lot of vintage stuff too that's not made anymore that would get a similar kind of nod. The uh, J, um, the Esterbrook, Esterbrook J. J, the Parker 51. Yeah. You know, there's probably a number of like Schaefer's and things like that, you know, that would fall into that. I don't know if we classify those the same because they're, again, they're not made anymore. Right. So, but but they were around for so long. Yeah, if you, you, could if you argue... do speak to a fountain pen collector and you say like, hey, what about a Parker 51? What about an Esterbrook J? They're not going to be like, oh, ew, 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 the 51. That's not, that's not really a fountain pen. Right, no, know? they're going to be like, yeah, the 51. That That's, yeah, you solid. know, I don't like them, but like, absolutely, that is a good pen, great place to start. Like, if you're collecting vintage pens, those mm -hmm. two pens, yeah. probably a great place to go. If you want to pick up a modern pen that's probably going to be around for a good long while, you know, the 2000 The Vanishing Point, probably yeah. a good place to pretty start. Pretty solid, pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, that's probably where I would land. I think there's probably some yeah, more- Yeah, I, I had um, similar thoughts, yeah. And, so, you know, if you want to go even lower on price, like more accessible, I said things like Lamy Safari, the Pilot Metropolitan, pretty much the most popular stuff that you hear people talking about all the time. They're like the workhorse pens that, you know- The, the Safari definitely is polarizing. There are a lot of people that just hate the Safari. But the I triangular think, grip and the yeah, clip I mean, it's on it it's, a, like it's a loud pen. Um, yeah, like, but it's undeniably a incredibly popular and established pen. And yeah, it's been around since the '80s. It's a game changer. Yeah, like that <laughs> that pen has brought along with the Metropolitan. I'd say mm -hmm. has brought more people into the hobby than probably any other fountain pen. Uh, at least today, but yeah. the preppy. I don't know. Preppy's been yeah. yeah. Preppy's up there too. So like you got to respect those. Like you know, as yeah. far as collecting. That pro these probably lie yeah. outside of the spirit of the question. You could argue, if you're like into collecting territory, you could argue that things like the Safari, the Metropolitan, all that are kind of left behind and forgotten about. So yeah. it's like, I don't think you would necessarily find those in most collectors' collections unless it was like, oh, this was one of my first pens yeah. and they have like some sign of sentimental tie to it. But if you're like deep into, you know, collecting the Mickeys or like, limited edition monograppas or whatever it might be that like uh, the, the really high end stuff that you could consider collecting kind of like watches. Um, you're probably not thinking about safaris very often. <clears throat> so, but I don't know. Fountain pen, also, fountain pen world is also like way more just open-ended. Yeah. Like I, you go to pen shows and stuff and you see people, they'll open up their pen cases and they've got, you know, $5,000 Namikis next to their Twisby Ecos and yeah, everything in between. And they're just, they like what they like and the price can be whatever it is, but you know, it can be all over the place. I don't think it's as like strict and defined as it is in other Here's a curveball though. Where do you think the Mont Blanc 149 lands here? Oh, interesting. Because um, even fountain pen collectors that are like very established within the fountain pen community, sure, they might look at the 149 and say, it's overpriced, it's overrated, but none of them really say it's not a good pen. I think no, it's, it's objectively it's, a good it's, pen. Yeah, it's, yeah, everybody agrees that it is a yeah, good pen for sure. I don't know if it's. Uh, I think that the only down. I think the only negative thing that you know the collectors that I've been familiar with would say about it is that well, it would be you'd get more bang for your buck to get multiple three hundred dollar pens. Yeah, I mean, w I think you know, I I have a couple of. Mont Blancs, um, and they're objectively good pens. I especially like the nibs on them. Um, but there's nothing like that amazing about them yeah. that's different from pens that you can get from other brands. Uh, what you get is the recognition and the branding, like yeah. the White Star. Like if you give someone a Mont Blanc pen, just the, the kind of the average person, they're more likely to know what that is than most other pen brands. And there's a premium that you pay for that branding because they've marketed the live-in hell out of that brand. 
So they're getting paid a premium for the branding. So would you say that that one is a more accurate comparison to the Speedmaster than say the Lamy 2000 or the Vanishing Point? Uh, I don't know because I don't know where the Speedmaster falls in like the watch world well enough. I think maybe like me not knowing much about watches, Rolex is the brand that comes mind to most. But I also know that there's some very legit Rolexes that are like Rolex respected. would probably be the Mont Blanc of the watch world, wouldn't it? I would pose that as an offering. Yeah. But I, I, we know so I little don't know about enough watch about industry. watches yeah. to say if that truly is the right matchup, but I feel like that's a pretty safe thing to say. Yeah. You know, like Mont Blanc makes really good products. Is everything they make worth every dollar you spend objectively as the product probably not you know because there's so much branding and stuff and they do make all kinds of different crazy looking pens um but i would you know it, you could probably say that like that's kind of where maybe like rolex would fall or something like that yeah, knowing because what it's got I such know. brand it's got such branding yeah that it's almost eponymous it's be, to fountain pen like mont blanc is to fountain pen as I rolex mean, is to watch i can say like ever since i got into this business and started telling people like oh i sell fountain pens the two brands that come up the most from people that are not into fountain pens, they're like, oh, like Mont Blancs, you know, if they're kind of familiar, or they're like, oh, like Cross. That's if they have like a corporate thing, because Cross yeah. is so big in like the corporate <clears throat> gift world. Those are pretty much the only brands that most people if know. If someone asks me- And then me, I'm like, oh no, like Pilot. And they're like, oh, Pilot, you know? Yeah. They know that from like G2s and stuff like that, but they have no idea about Namiki. If and someone all told me stuff. I collect nice watches, I'm gonna think Rolex. Yeah. Like like someone would think Mont Blanc for you being outside of that world. Right. Me being outside yeah, of it's watches. Got, it's got the branding. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna I mean, think how Rolex. many ads in you know, whatever magazines, boating magazines and whatnot do you see like Rolex and all that in there? But are you gonna see ads for the more niche kind of obscure brands? Probably yeah. not. You know, so it's it's it, it's probably similar. You're yeah. paying for marketing in the same way you're paying for Mont Blanc's marketing. Yeah. You definitely are. Interesting. All right. And, yeah. Well, that, was a, that, was a, that was an interesting big, question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, cool. All right. We're going to take it home. All right. Question number five comes to us from Carl. Mm. And we actually covered this a little bit in this last one. Carl says, mm -hmm. some vintage fountain pens are still going strong as much as 100 years later. Mm. Do you think today's modern pens will do so as well? If so, which ones will stand the test of time? Hmm. Still going strong. How do you read into that? Because I think there are vintage pens that have a vintage pen following that's still going strong. I think he's. Meant, I think speaking. he means like build quality. Like if you did go and get an Estherbrook J. Okay, so not like be still doing... being offered, still being made. Because no. I can't think of much. No, I think that he's talking about just the around. physical pen itself. Okay, sure. Yeah. I now mean, I would say that a lot of them, like mm, I don't know, still going strong because a lot of them have to have like replaced bladders and stuff like that. Like, oh sure. What pen is still going strong that doesn't need some sort of refurbishment? I mean, anything over time is going to need refurbishment. I don't think that like not needing any work done on it after a hundred years. How can you be classify? The how can you still? How can you classify like this is still going strong even though it's like needing to be constantly maintained? That is a good question. See, to me, still going strong means. I haven't had to do anything to it. Hey, it's still going strong. I mean, I don't know any pen that's 100 years old that won't have had needed something done to it because like <clears throat> a lot of things back then were like bladder filled. Yeah, because I- bladder, no bladder of any material is going to last you 100 years. I yeah, what it is. so I don't know if a bladder pen can ever can be considered still going strong. Because... But I mean, you can pretty easily replace a bladder. Like that's not as big a deal. That's like you can have a car, but like if your car is 100 years old, the rubber on the, the hoses and the engine and stuff yeah. are going to break down over time. That's true. Okay. So like you have to do some basic things like that. Point taken. Just from age and environment and stuff like that. That's just oxidation. But you know, the th the thing itself is is still good. Yeah. The you know right I mean? the writing is still going strong. Yeah. And okay. like the nib I'll and all that. that kind of stuff. So so I would I would interpret that a little looser than like, you know, a modern pen that you wouldn't think needs any work done for, you know, a decade. It's not like, oh, 90 years from now, that pen should still be functioning exactly the same. It's like, well. Well, let me ask you this. Like, do you think, you know, that, you know, something made in like the 90s as opposed to like the, you know, 50s, given 100 years uh, use on both pens, mm. do you think the one made in the 90s will need less upkeep and be, quote unquote, going strong in a better... I feel like we're entering into some 
hot take territory ah. here between vintage and modern. And I'll say I, I won't make a super strong stance one way or the other because I don't feel that I'm quite knowledgeable enough to say with like a very firm opinion. So I'll speak about some of the things that are just coming to mind for me. You're a lot more kind bothered by being ignorant than I am. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm, I'm I, stupid. Here's my thought. <laughs> I acknowledge my own ignorance, but I'm very aware of it. That's really cool. I think and more I people should be like, like yeah. You. Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I think we have enough of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, but like, so some of the argument with vintage, right, is like, well, look at the number of like vintage, like ebonite pens and stuff like that that are still around. Fair, fair argument. <clears throat> you know, one point about that is how many of those pens were initially made and how many of them are still around? I think that's important because if you're like, yeah, well, there's still, there's like hundreds, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these pens still around. But yeah, but if you're like, yeah, but if there were 12 billion of them made, I don't, these are numbers I'm just making They up. made a lot of 51s. They made a lot of Parker 51s. So it's like, yeah, there's a lot of them around vintage wise, but proportionally there were a whole ton of them available. So were they really any better quality than other brands of pens? They were just more popular and more of them were made. So they're still around more. I can't answer that question without having all that information, but that is part of what comes to mind for me. Now you can objectively look at a pen and say the build quality is really good. And you know, there are people that I will say like in the vintage world, this is where like you, you, I know you have this experience too, Drew, especially if you go to like a pen show, you walk around to like one table and somebody's got some stuff and you're like, that person knows more about what's on this table than I will ever know in my life, no matter how hard I try. Going to a pen show is you go so the next, humbling. You go to the next table over and it's something else in a different vertical. You don't, I don't even you know? need to go to a table at a pen show to meet someone who knows more than me. It's crazy, like, right? It's so... Golly. It's very humbling. Yeah, so. It's very humbling. But it, for one, it's really cool because it shows just how much depth there is to this hobby yeah. should you want to go mm -hmm. there. And there's so much history too. So you can literally devote your entire life to studying the history of like one pen model, you know, because these things go back a hundred, you know, some of these things go back a hundred years. There's so much that you could learn about, you know, all the details of it. So there's a lot there. So I can't like fully answer this question, but I will say, you know, in broad strokes, you can, you can definitely make arguments about they don't make it like they used to. To which I would say that's true to a degree. I think the modern materials that we have, including modern hard rubbers and things like that, are objectively better materials than existed previously because technology, progress, you know. Now, is that true on all pens? Are all acrylic pens better than, you know, older ebonites and stuff like that? No. Like acrylic from a longevity standpoint is a better material than like a nitrocelluloid. Nitrocelluloid was an earlier formation of acrylic, basically, but it warped, it's flammable, it yellows, it can crack. You know, if it's not stored in the right conditions, it doesn't hold up as well as a modern acrylic would. Does that make a modern acrylic pen better than celluloid? That's a hot take. I wouldn't say that. But in terms of longevity, we'll have to wait 100 years to see. But all else being equal, it probably will last longer because technology has improved. Now, you know, uh, the thing that you don't have with modern pens is the same repairability because back when fountain pens were the mainstay writing instrument, there were pen shops with repair people and there were literally like training programs for retailers and, and you know, every major pen company had traveling sales people, traveling repair people that were educating about how to repair these pens, how to use them, how to tune the nibs, all that kind of stuff. It was just much more in the ether. It was much more common. Same thing with at the, like, uh, typewriters and stuff like that. Like back when it was more common, that was just in the industry and that was more the norm. So if you look at vintage pens to repair a sack, there's all kinds of sack materials, there's great education tools, all that kind of stuff is still available to do that. Are we gonna have that for today's modern pens? Not so much, not so much. You know, if you wanna repair an Omos pen, Omos is a company that went under 78 years ago. Well, if you wanna repair an Omos pen now, Good luck, because Omos is not around anymore. I have, Are there even people that know how to repair any of those things or can you get parts or anything? No, not really. So 
it's like anything else modern. This isn't just fountain pens, but anything else with modern manufacturing, it's not made to be repaired and, and rebuilt and stuff like that as much as things were back in the day. So to that argument, I would say no, modern pens are not necessarily going to be able to be repaired and used and stuff like that. But if you're not using a pen super heavily and it's just a pen that you're keeping around and you store it correctly and all that kind of stuff, I think all else being equal, a modern pen would last longer than an older pen because the materials are better, you know, the manufacturing precision and stuff is arguably better. Um, so I think you you have a case to be made. So my answer is kind of both. It just depends on how you're viewing that like 100 year lens. I mean, my answer is emphatically yes. Just looking at the ones I mentioned earlier, the 2000 mm -hmm. and the vanishing point, mm -hmm. because both of those pens have been around since the 60s. True. So we're not, you know, I think at this point, unless something dramatically ch changes, it's it's more or less proven anyway. Yeah, you could argue that like even the way they're being made now might even be better than how they were made 60 years ago. Right. So I think you that know, you, technology you, improves. You can pick up one of those two pens and without any sort of maintenance other than mm -hmm. just routine cleaning yeah. and they're going to work just fine. Yeah. So I think that we've seen enough proof with pens made, you know, post fountain pen golden era mm. that, you know, going and finding these pens, whether it's, you know, from the you know 80s or whatever, they're fine. Like they're a hundred percent fine. Yeah. You know, even, even weird, you know, pens like the yeah. you know, Mu or the Murex, like mm. a pen with an integrated nib. That's a part of its body. Those still work great. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, so yeah, I think that they'll absolutely be just as good as they were a hundred years ago. Yeah. Now, granted, if they're a crappy pen and they're made with, you know, crappy, uh, production standards and they crack and stuff, then yeah, no, those weren't. But oh, if you're- Do you, if do you you're, know how many crappy vintage pens there are? Oh yeah. That yeah. were made with, like the reason that steel nibs are, it's not as bad these days, but certainly when we started this business 14, 12 years ago, the reputation of steel nibs was something to be overcome mm -hmm. because vintage steel, the alloys used in vintage steel was not nearly as good as modern stainless steel. So there was a reputation of really, truly crappy stainless steel nibs in, in pens that were very old. Um, and I won't even get into all that because that's a whole other rabbit yeah. hole. But modern stainless steel nibs, worlds better than any of the steel nibs of the past. So that alone right there is a massive improvement. Yeah, so I definitely think, especially if we're talking Pilot, Lamy, the brands that mm -hmm. have been around for long enough to you know, prove themselves out. Yeah. I definitely think in a hundred years, those pens will be as good, if not better than the vintage ones that have been around for a hundred. Interesting. I guess we'll just have to wait until we're 140. And I plan we'll on see. it. All right. That <laughs> is our Q and A. And that was a lengthy one. That was a, we went on a journey with that one. We did. I will say. We did. My brain is a little hot right now. If I got to well, admit. Let's. I've used a lot of mental energy. You know what? How about a trip to the beach, Brian? Hey, let's do it. I All love right. beach. I'm really good at beach. <laughs> let's do it. All right. All right. Let's check this out. We've got the right, Drew. Monte Grappa. Grab your, grab your swim trunks. Elmo Beach. We're going to the beach. Look at that logo. This is their relatively newer logo. Came out with it a couple of years ago. It looks good. Sturdy box, I will say. And it's like a embossed, kind of debossed, I guess, technically. Um, it's got the Monte Grappa logo in there. I like the the hinged flap on the box because really it makes it easy that. to get out of there because otherwise you're like trying to get it out and it's kind of crazy. So there you go, Monograppa. Packaging is on point, I got to say. I'll move out of the way and um, get the shadow I there. do like it. Okay. Comes in its little sleeve, a couple of branded cartridges there, and it does come with a converter as well, which I can't remember if it's in the pen or if it's uh, underneath. I guess we'll find out. Look at that. That is stunning. And I don't know how well the like glitter shows up in here. Oh, I'm getting it. Yeah, you get it. Especially down here at the bottom. Oh, it's got like yeah, give that a turn for me. Oh yeah. It's got it's got a lot going on down there. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. And you've got the Monte Grappa logo there. Yep. Um looks really good. Like that's engraved and filled. Mm-hmm. And then a numbering right there on the back. Yep. Made in Italy. Or is that not looks a numbering? Really... Um No, no numbering. No, just, just made in Italy. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's not numbered got the roller clip, which we saw tested at the Monte Grappa factory. They have a machine yeah, that they, pulls they, that clip like hundreds of times. I think they said that um, 
I mean, not every clip, obviously, but when they test them, they do a 10,000. Yeah. Oh, my God. 10,000 pulls. All right. And then it's got the threads, which the thing I love about the Elmo. So it's got these like squared off metal threads. So these threads are not sharp. No. They're kind of chunky, um, but they're very smooth. And when you combine that with the resin cap, um, it just, it feels so smooth. I'm very conscious about how I'm screwing and unscrewing this pen mm-hmm. now after the recent pen casts. Um, there you go. So very light cap. Um, you got some fuzz in the nib. Number six size. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Uh, number six size nib. One thing that Drew and I are both big fans of with their nibs. So these are stainless steel nibs, but just because it's that little bit extra, they actually plate these nibs in rhodium. It doesn't change the color because it's still silvery looking but it just makes it a little bit shinier. Um, so it looks like, it, just looks, it looks like rhodium plated gold. It, yeah. looks, it looks almost like freshly um, polished sterling silver. Like that, it has kind of that shine to it like that. Um, but yeah, it's really cool because it's got like the sandy kind of portion of it. Um, now I will say these materials vary a lot from pen to pen. Um, we did photograph like five of them on our site and, and put them next to each other. I wish we could do special requests, but we just can't. So you could end up with, you know, more or less of the different blues and the sandy. Like, some have more dark, like some a, have more there's turquoise. There's like a teensy little bit of sand up on this one. Um, but I brought my other pen just to show an example of how it can differ. So like this one, it's got a lot more sand mm-hmm. going on in the top there, but it does not have nearly the same amount of the, the blue. So I don't know which one is better. It's like, it's very different between the two. So they're going to be all over the place, but they're all gorgeous. But they all look really good and they all are very beach. Um, Again, number six, Yovo nibs. Um, Nibs write very smooth, flows well, standard international converters. Another nice little touch uh, that they did is, you know, when we, when they first did these pens, because we, we've done these pens uh, with them as exclusives for a while, actually. We've done that, many of them. Uh, the body was a much lighter weight. Well, they actually added a sleeve, uh, a brass sleeve inside of here, purely for the fact that it adds a little bit of weight to it and helps with the balance of the pen. So it's just little touches like that, little touches like the rhodium and the roller clip and stuff that Monograppa does that just like mm, really makes it uh that little bit extra so it's not the cheapest pen you know 316 for a steel nib pen it's up there as more of a premium steel nib pen but you i feel like you're really getting you know well there's nothing what there's, you're paying for this is it. a resin that is made by Montegrappa. yes it's something very unique to them and the multicolor kind of thing like that like yeah. that is really hard to do um and i can imagine too their failure rate's probably pretty high uh, with this because, I mean, to try to get the color gradient like this, you can't just, you know, use a six foot rod and turn it on a CNC machine. You have to like hand place, you know, yeah, it's like where you're, you're each doing... of these materials is going to fall on the pen. Yeah. A lot of extra time, a lot of extra handwork and consideration involved. So there you go. There's a couple different pens. Um, yeah. And this one here says AP on it because this was the artist proof. So that's my... That's my little treat that I get to keep. Beautiful. Because that was the, so this was the original like one that we got to like approve the design because they do it in concept, but then they, we have to get a sample and approve that. But then you get some that show up like this and I'm kind of like, oh, I like the blue. Know, you like the dark blue. <laughs> I wish blue. I had a little more blue. Maybe I'll swap this cap on it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm kind of kidding, but kind of not. Um, so yeah, anyway, so there you go. Really cool material, really cool pen. I'm um, not going to ink it up and write with it because it's a Yovo steel. We've written with those a bunch before, but um, writes really nicely. And uh, there you go. Beautiful. Beach. Beach. Enjoy your beach. All right, Drew. All right, Brian. Now that we're done beaching, I think it's on to what's happening, right? When was the last time you went to the beach, Brian? I went to the beach this year. Did you? Before that, it was 2014. Oh, wow. So it had been a while. Me too. Yep. But I went, we to, had, I we went, went to the beach this year, but... Before that, it had been years. We went overnight to the beach. We spent half a day. I, I went on, on a day beach. trip. Yep. Yeah. And that was enough. And we slept overnight. And the next morning, I was like, hey, does anybody want to go down to the beach before we go? And everybody was like, no. They were like in their devices with the blinds closed. And I was like, 
I think I think we did good picking one day at the beach. Yep. <laughs> I was like, I have a very introverted family. Well done. I am the most extroverted in my family, if that means anything. Wow. And I'm not that extroverted. No. I just, you know, like to have some human interaction like yeah. every now and then. Anyway. All right. What's happening, Drew? You're, What's happening? We were off for a week. I was off for a week, as were you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, some things happened. I will mm. say it was kind of a bummer of a week. I, I had mm. some personal stuff happen, and I kind of fell into some depression, you know, mm. to be perfectly honest. And it was like under normal circumstances, and I'm, I'm usually, as you know, a very, very upbeat, positive person. That Yeah, like annoyingly so. Thank you. Um, so... This doesn't happen often to me, but, you know, I'm human. It happens every now and then. Mm. And uh, maybe once a year I'll mm. get funky. And then, uh, but, you know, I, you got to process it. You got to figure out what's going on. Mm. Talk to the people in your life you need to talk to. And, you know, take take some steps. Yeah. And I think that this week, because, A, you know, it was like, you know, the week before we get paid. So I didn't have, like, a lot of money to go start a bunch of product mm. projects. I wasn't going to go to Lowe's and buy a bunch of stuff to fix a bunch of stuff, which I could have done. Mm. So that kept me inside. Mm. Shannon had just started her new job at the office now, so she wasn't at home. Oh, so so I was by change. myself. Didn't have yeah. a lot of... Didn't have anybody to talk to. and Because so Archer, Archer was still in school, right? So yeah. you're, like, at home by yourself. Yeah, so... Three dogs. Yeah, so I didn't, like... I didn't feel, like, really bad enough to, like, say, all right, I need to fix this. You know, I, mm. you need to kind of pull yourself out of here, Drew. But also I, but I was just playing video games all week. So I was distracted enough to not feel like bottom of the barrel, mm. but also still depressed. Mm. So I just had this like haze yeah. of depression mm. all week and it's not a great week for me to be by myself and, you know, mm. just kind of like drowning in video games, but which was great. But is that caused by the downtime you think, or did it just, no, just kind of coincide? No, I know no, there were, there was a catalyst for it. Okay. I just didn't, I didn't process it with the efficiency that I normally know how to process depression with. Gotcha. Um, so it just kind of, I got, there was this lull. There was this mm. prolonged lull. Like usually there's, there's a lull, you know, there's, yeah. there's a couple days, but this normal. one was yeah. drawn out just because of where I was. Um, yeah. Okay. So, but mm. anyway, got that taken care of, came out of it. I was fine. Got done what I needed to get done. And, mm. you know, but, uh, you know, it's just, it is what it is. I know that, you know, we've all been there before. I know you've been there and, oh, you know. It's very natural, I think. Yeah. yeah. So to totally fine. But yeah. I'm all good now. But, you know, just being perfectly honest, it was kind of a crappy week for me. Mm. But um, I did get some stuff done. I went to the library, took a bunch of our old mm -hmm. uh, Santa visit VHS cassettes to the library to get digitized. From like from your childhood? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, you know, there was a. Uh, um, one Christmas, I asked for this was 1988, I think. I asked for a um, the Ghostbusters firehouse Ooh, toy. Cool. Yeah, and then in uh, let's see, 90, so 90 and 91, I asked for the same thing because I didn't get it in 90, but I got it in 91. It was the GI Joe General, which is a really oh. big vehicle. Um, so I did I did get that, and then in 93, I asked for the Talk Boy. Oh yeah, that was the talk boy year. Did you get a talk? Boy? Oh yeah. Oh okay. Oh, I got a talk boy. I love oh, that. Oh, so you had a talk boy, I but did. you talked recently about getting it back because I guess you don't you don't have any. Oh no, I was, it was like a hypothetical. If we could have like a toy from our childhood, oh, which one? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to still have that. Gotcha. Um, so I did that. Um, I played a lot of uh, Ghost of Tsushima, which is a PS4 okay. game that I used to have, but I bought it on PS5. Because it was the same cost as like the PS5 upgrade. Because if you have a game on PS4, okay. you can like upgrade it to the PS5 version. Okay. But it was like 30 bucks. I'm like, I can just buy the brand new game for 30 bucks and it comes with That's weird. some extra stuff. So anyway, I'm a physical media guy. So I just bought the new game. Yeah. Don't they sell two versions of it? Like a, or is that the Xbox that like you can get a disc version and a that, hard, hard drive only That's version? the PS5. Yeah. It's PS5? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I like the, I, I need my discs. You need your discs. Yep. Because you own them. Kind of. Like, I don't know. Like to right now with ps5 discs you don't really know if oh doesn't it like not contain the full some game? of them do some of them do okay. some of them don't okay i know so it's anyway. so weird it is we're 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 seeing the demise of physical media for sure yeah so it's... we're in we're in an in-between point but i see the end i see mm, the end unfortunately mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um do you think the ps5 is going to be the last playstation no it was like, i think it'll be the last disc the last disc based one yeah probably interesting um, 
but uh, yeah, we'll see. Hmm. And so I played that. It's a such a great game. I uh, I'm loving it even more the second time through because I kind of know what's going to happen at the mm-hmm. end. It's all about like you're a samurai who is kind of faced with the fact that to protect your your country or your island, you need to do some kind of un samurai like things, mm. and you're trying to reconcile doing the right thing, saving your friends and your family, but without doing kind of the whole Bushido thing and mm. knowing now how the ending goes, I'm now kind of playing a little bit differently than I did the first time. Cause I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to do this or that? So I was very hesitant at first playthrough, but mm. now that I know what the ending is, I'm like, I know how to play yeah. to kind of connect to the story and the journey a little bit more. So I'm enjoying it a lot. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And I went ahead and watched Indiana Jones five, the dial of destiny. Okay. So this was the Indiana Jones that has a good chunk where Harrison Ford is de-aged to look like Indy from the 80s or in movie chronology, the 40s. Right. Um, And it looked good. Yeah? Like it looked really good. Was this like with like CGI type yeah. stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looked shockingly good. Wow. Weird. So it was weird, but it was, it was, it was good. It was... If uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was Rocky Five, which was kind of like the weakest part of the series, yeah. then this was Rocky Balboa, which is the one he made afterwards that kind of like redeemed it a little bit. Right. Obviously not as good as the originals, sure. but still like if it were to end here, it would be, it'll be a much better place to end. And then Crystal Skull. Yeah, yeah, same thing with like Rocky Balboa. Like, you know, technically he went on to make Creed, which is different, but anyway, a good mm. place to end. He kind of, he okay. came, he came back left us in a happier place. So gotcha. I, w- I was a fan of it. I, I enjoyed it. So yeah. that was a fun watch. But just mm. that one movie, that was, that was all I did. Okay. Um, and then uh, I wanted to just mention, I don't know how often you get your kids Happy Meals. Uh, I tend I tend to get Archer. Never at this point. They eat too much. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah they they're get, well beyond that's true. that at this point. So I get Archer gets McDonald's, you know, maybe once every two weeks or something like that. You mm-hmm. know, probably more than I need, but whatever. Um, Happy Meal toys suck, Brian. Are they even toys anymore? Or are they just like Some, punch out cardboard crap? Like, cause the times that I did take my kids there, it was like garbage. It was, it was not even really a toy. Like I remember the stuff that we had growing up. They were actual toys. Yeah. Now it's just like cardboard cutouts. Crap. So stuff that you fold up into he, a thing. I'm he like, got no. a, uh, it was like some crash bandicoot meal, you know, the okay. PlayStation character oh, yeah. from like oh, a yeah. new video game. Yeah, so yeah. it was a plush triangle with Crash Bandicoot on one side and some enemy on the other side, just printed. Okay. okay. And it's just a squishy plush triangle. Okay. With a loop. I mean, that's something. I don't, is it a keychain? I mean, it's, it's, it's just a fluffy lump with <laughs> a picture know. on it. My kids like have so many stuffed animals, I can't even. It's not even a stuffed animal, it's just a triangle. It's a like, stu- what do you do with it? Stuffed triangle. Yes. With an animal on it. Yes. It's just it's just like a screen printed image. It, it it might as well just be like a a, a piece of paper. Yeah. I'm just and then you know, <laughs> so and I'm just yeah. thinking about like the transformers that like mm-hmm. turns into like you know you've got like a you know a, a cup with a straw that turns into a dinosaur or a transformer. Those were like the best. Happy God, toys. they were the hamburger that mm-hmm. like turned into a transformer thing. I had that yep. one. Um, don't you have? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, don't you have? Oh, you have the hamburger right have there. Right yeah. Look at that. There he is. That's so cool. That, that's that a, is a that's transformer. A happy meal toy. That is a happy meal toy. Got I got these on eBay because I was telling Archer about them one time. And he's like, that sounds amazing. I'm like, you know what I can do for you, bro? I'm gonna get you some. So I kept this one because this one's my favorite. But I also got some of the really dinosaur cool. ones. But like, man, this these were toys. Anyway, that's been bothering me because. And even Archer was like, "What? What is this crap? Like, <laughs> come on now." You trained him well. Uh, what is this garbage? Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, that happened. I got. On did a they high... do like toys and cereal too? No, kind of got me thinking about. It. I haven't. No. Gotten no, because that's because uh, uh, Americans can't be trusted to have toys and food. <sighs> Just like why well, that's why we can't have Kinder eggs. That's. Yeah, I've watched videos about mm-hmm. why that is. That's some bull crap. Mm-hmm. But... You're just going to eat the whole bag, apparently. And no. I don't know. It's a conspiracy. <sighs> so uh, this <laughs> big, weekend. Big candy. The big candy. <laughs> this weekend, um, uh, my brother Zach ha- had his birthday celebration. So we went 
to see the new Godzilla movie in the theater. Ooh. This was Godzilla minus one is what they're calling it. I don't even know what is what with Godzilla movies. You don't really need to. They're, they're starting over. It's really? just It's not like Godzilla fighting another monster or anything like that. It's just Godzilla being a menace and destroying the city and being... I mean, that's kind of fun, right? It that's is. kind of the point. It was amazing. Like, was, I feel like with a franchise like that, it would be easy to try to make too much story to oh, tie and they, it all and they do. There's currently two Godzillas. Like, there's an American Godzilla made by Legendary Pictures. Okay. Um, and that's the... They've already made, like, four of those. Okay. Um, but then there's the, the Toho Godzilla, which is the Japanese, like, okay. original. Like so legit. they just restarted their thing. Huh. But Godzilla was scary. Really? He was just monstrous. He was mean and villainous, and you didn't like him. He was just... A force of nature, which okay, it was great and honestly a great story too. You know, hmm. it was subtitled, but uh, a great. It was uh, like immediately following World War One, and you follow mm. the story of a disgraced kamikaze pilot, and oh, wow. he his you know he keeps having these run-ins with Godzilla, and that's obviously stressful. But then he's also got this like cultural shame mm. that's eating at him as well. So it's like a really great story. Wow. Um, it's deep. Godzilla minus one, man. Fantastic wow. movie. What is the minus one? I don't know. Mean? I don't know. Maybe that's their way of saying like we're starting from the beginning, like way oh. beginning, like nineteen, you know, forty-five. I guess I don't know. But okay. great movie. We <laughs> planned to go to Texas Day Brazil after that. Oh. They could not get us in until five, so we spent the downtime um, at the uh, barcade next door at the uh, oh, yeah. Draftcade in Short Pump. Yeah, um, I've never been in there, but I've seen it. It was not bad. It was like 10 bucks to play whatever you want. <clears throat> so we played uh, Sunset Riders from beginning to end. It's an arcade game with cowboys. And okay. the three of us, like we used to play that on Super Nintendo. So, oh, wow. you know, here we got like three, you know, late 30s dudes <laughs> uh, playing an arcade game that we used to play in our living room. Wow. Like, So it was good fun. That's good. Hard, and hard we, on nostalgia there. We beat That's the whole good. thing too. Really? So, yeah. So it's not like you're putting in quarters every time. You're just no. like, you just play and just play. You get to do. That's cool. It is until you go over to the Ninja Turtle arcade machine. Oh, and you try like... to play, but then you realize that you're only three brothers, but someone had already been playing as Michelangelo, and you just want to let Michelangelo die so the three of you can continue playing. Mm -hmm. But you realize that the kid that was playing before you put the insert coin button 386 times. So Michelangelo just won't die. <laughs> so we just keep having to move him over. <laughs> oh my god! So that was annoying. Why so, couldn't one of you just be Michelangelo? We only have three people. There's they had all four turtles working, yeah. and and they had done that to like all four turtles. Oh, so some kid was just like, oh look, I'm putting in infinity quarters. And, Sounds like something I would have done as a kid. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it was it was it was fun though. It was and like our dream as a kid, man. I like I, never. I like always wanted more quarters. Yeah, and we played The Simpsons. We played Turtles. Oh man, The oh, Simpsons! Yeah. Wow, it was great. That's a throwback. We had a good time. The X Men machine was down, unfortunately. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, but man, it wow. was just kind of an impromptu thing, just trying to kill time. But it ended up being really fun. Wow, and, Battle Toads is another one that brings me way back. Oh, it's so hard. Battletoads is really hard. Such a painful game. I still have that on the OG Game Boy. I got Battletoads. Oh, yeah, Battletoads on the Game Boy. Yeah. I never played that one. Yeah. I only ha had it on the uh, Nintendo. And I got, I think I have Ninja Turtles as well. Nice. But everything is hard on the Game Boy. Oh, that 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 whole generation. That whole system is just Punishing. Like, yeah. Yeah, and we, we were playing these games, and we're realizing, like, these aren't good games. Like, <laughs> no, they're they're, they're They're just there to take your money. Yeah. Like, you can't, like, console games were good because... Yeah. The, the, that game, in the home. they yeah. just wanted you to, they just wanted to make it last. Yeah. They didn't want you to just die constantly. They just wanted you to have to, you know, get good so you could finish the game. But you had to get really good repetitiveness. But these arcade games, like there's no way to, like if you got good at an old Mega Man game, you could go the whole time and not get hit. Right. These arcade games, like, no, you're going to die. We're going to take your money yeah. and that's it. So we're playing yeah. these. We're like, this isn't fun. We're just <laughs> getting our butts kicked. Yeah. Like, it's still nostalgic though, so it was fun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then uh, we went to Texas Day Brazil and ate a lot of meat. Yes, that's so, what one does at that restaurant. That is what you do. You don't touch that salad bar. No, no. You fill up on lettuce. No. No way. But uh, that was a delightful day. Zach had a great time. I got him a, uh, a button-up shirt that looked like Eddie Van Halen's guitar. It was like the red with like the black and white stripes all over it. Oh, my it, gosh. Wow. Which, of course, he just loved because we're going to go see Sammy Hagar in uh, July. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and then 
the following day we went to a gift exchange with our friends and um that was fun i had recently been talking to my friend josh about exotic candy and so he yeah. got me a bag of candy from mexico and uh the first thing i tried was some sort of like lollipop and it was horrible like it was salty and spicy at the same time inside was like mango flavored so i bit it and crunched into it and like inside was a delightful sucker okay but the outside like i could not even like i, I was trying to power through it to like get through that outer layer oh my but it was like sucking on worcestershire sauce or something oh, like that like no, oh, what kind of thing you think of with a lollipop right? oh it was so bad i kind of want to bring one in for you i thought about it but oh. i'm like i'm not gonna do that to him it's just It'd it's be fun. I'd try it. It's so bad, though, man. <laughs> it's so bad. It's pretty bad because you're you're down for anything. And yeah, well, they were. Bad. Everybody was laughing at me because I kept on going back to it. Because I'm like, I'm gonna get through <laughs> this, but I couldn't. It just. Mm. Oh man. So anyway, that was fun. He knows me well. So nice, nice. Uh, that was silly. Uh, and then we attempted to do our annual child plus dog photo shoot for our Christmas cards. Oh, yes. This has been a journey in years past. Hasn't it, it has. <laughs> it has. I remember you talking about this before and you were like, it has. this is the best we got. <laughs> so took a different approach this year. Oh. We you tried. AI to generate it. That way you could Michael Scott Photoshop everybody together. You're not wrong. <laughs> really? Is um, that what you did? We, uh, for maybe a minute, tried to get all three of them, all four of them, dog, child, dog, dog, to sit still, I immediately gave up on that. Wow. And I said, Shannon, put one dog there. I'm going to take a photo of that one dog. There you go. Put one human and a dog in the middle. Take a photo of that. Put one dog over on the right. Took a photo of that. And then using my rudimentary Photoshop skills. Oh, my gosh. Brought them together. Like, that's going to be good enough. Yeah. Luckily, the tree was behind them. So there was enough busyness in the background for mm -hmm. me to get the job done. Okay. There's one spot where Archer's knee is that didn't quite look mm. the way I wanted to do, but it was very dark. Shadows kind of helped me out a little bit. I don't think like the family members are going to know that it's Photoshop. Mm. Um, but uh, well, now they will because you just talked about. They it. don't watch the pain, guys. <laughs> um, so that was a thing, but it was a it was yeah. an adventure, and it, it came out okay. We'll see, but it's all a matter of it's just for Christmas right? card, yeah. whatever. It gets the job done. It's kids and dogs, hooray! Yep. Put it up on your fridge for three days and then take it down. Um, yeah, we still have a bunch on our fridge. We like never take <laughs> from them last down. year. Oh, we got ones from like years past. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty, we don't get a ton of them. Awesome. Uh, well, anyway. you'll you'll get one. I'll I'll send you one of these. All Just right. don't look at Archer's I'll name. I'll put it on there. That's all I'm going to be able to see now that you mentioned. Dang it. Well, that's fine. Just don't tell Rachel. Um, she'll see. She'll see it, Drew. You know her. I know she'll she, find everything. She might honestly. not know. Oh, yeah, well, she won't know. Um, she won't look at you. And then I wanted to say, like, I was given an early uh, Christmas present. I wanted to show you this. Oh, yeah. What you got? Ooh, that is sparkly. Do you know what this is? Um, I don't know what that is. This is a pilot Kakuno. Oh wow! Covered in Urushi. Wow, that's a bit extra, isn't it? That looks cool, though. It does. Um, At this, first, I almost thought it was like a Banu because it's no, got a little this bit is of a talisman shape. It is a brown Rushi Kakuno. It's done wow. by somebody named uh, on Instagram, Garage Fountain Pen. And what he does <laughs> is he just takes cheap fountain pens and Rushifies them. Oh, my gosh. And that's just all it is. It's just you, he'll take you know a Preppy or a Safari or a oh, wow. Kakuno and covers them in a Rushi. So this thing's got a lot of sparkly... Wow. Um, it was made for me, and uh, the person just said, "Make it brown." And oh my god, that's what he did. So wow. I just had to share this because that's just hilarious. That's that a brilliant brown. I got it. Is, I'm, I love it. I love it so much. It is just. It's just like. I mean, you legitimately love the Kakuno, so it, oh yeah, it's absolutely. Very fitting. And it's an extra fine too, which is my favorite. Oh my gosh. Um, but it's got a little bit of abalone in there, and then just some like messy brown mud it's sparkle. Very glittery. It's but it's also just very brown. It's just magical, yeah. and I love it. Um, I'm not gonna let you touch it just in case. But uh, yeah, I'm very allergic to yeah. And also, if you, if you wanted to go to Garage Fountain Pen and check out his stuff, great. But he's very clear that. He doesn't respond to messages quickly. He's very clear that he doesn't take all commissions. He's very clear I mean, that 
he, if he's yerushifying preppies and kakunos, yeah, he's, like, he's clearly not in it for the money. No, no. He, he, <laughs> it's a passion project. I think I'm in his sure. description, he says, like, I'm a grumpy fountain pen maker slash woodworker. <laughs> I might not respond to you. That's awesome. Yeah, so don't bother him. But oh, if he's look, a woodworker, that, look that at, explains it. Yeah, look at his stuff. It's cool. But <laughs> like, fun. just know that I respect you, that. you're probably going to get ignored. So I really appreciate that. Um, uh, this got made, and I'm wow, just I, that's I, really cool. Yeah, one of I, a kind. I treasure it. Probably yeah. for the best. So that's my new pen for the week. That's um, that's really cool. Yeah, it's pretty special. Yeah. So yeah, that's pretty much the uh, the whole Drew story All recently. Right. Well, I'm sorry it was a kind of a bummer of a week for you. But I mean, it it had it, it had a slump, but it finished it, it finished strong. Yeah. You know? yeah, I had a great weekend. Good. Well, you ready to hear about my week? I would love to. So. Um, Truth be told, I was not the instigator of this week off. Rachel was. Rachel basically was like, she needed this time off and was like, it'd be great if you could do it with me, but I'm. it's happening whether you are on board or not. I like that. Um, we got a big accounting project we're working on that she's invested a lot of time into. And mm. we have both of our kids' birthdays plus Christmas all happening in a pretty tight area. So it's a usually a pretty busy, pretty stressful time for us just every year because of the way things fall. Um, so she was like, I just want that time to take care of stuff around the house, that all that kind awesome. of stuff. And I was like, good for her. that's probably a good idea. I think I'll do that too. Um, so I didn't really have a big plan even going into the week of like what I was going to do. So I was kind of like Friday kind of rolled around and I was like, oh yeah, I have like off the next week what should I do? And normally in that circumstance, that's where I'm like, Hey, I've been thinking about like making that patio in the back. Let's do this whole project. Or that then, learning like, how to juggle. Consumes everything. Yeah, true. I could take on some usually pretty ambitious yeah. off the wall kind of a thing. But I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that this time. I'm not going to take on some big project. I was mostly successful on that. And I'll get to that in a second. But my whole approach was like, you know what? I'm very busy. I often will like have things that I'm like, oh man, like my front office at home, there's like a bunch of paperwork and stuff or like I got a bunch of stuff piled up on my workbench in the garage. And it's like, ah, man, if I just like could add an extra like week into my life, I would just like clean that up or organize this or take care of that. And so I was like, huh, I was like this is like an extra week of my life that I didn't quite plan. Yeah. And it was like, gifted to you. Yeah, it was kind of a gift. So yeah. I was like, let me work with that. And let me just like look at around like all the stuff around the house that I just like see. And I'm just like, ugh, I've been meaning to get to that for forever. It's like, let me actually get to that. And so it was like a whole week of that kind of stuff. That's what my week should have been. <laughs> oh. Just yesterday, I was looking at my railing. Some of the previous owner painted it black. It was okay. like really crappy, like latex mm, paint on okay. wood. Oh. So, so it's like you, peeling off. Oh, you look at it wrong. It scratches. Oh, mm, yeah. So I'm just like touching it up all the time, but it needs to be stripped. And yeah. oh my God, oh, that's tough to get. I see it every day. About. Yep. It's oh. that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Like just, it's, it's all that kind of stuff that I was just like, hmm. Okay. Let me actually address this. Nice. Things. So, um, I didn't start a major project, lots of kid family time stuff too, but the kids were in school. So it's like, was driving them to school. I really tried to like make it easy for Rachel too. So I was like, let me take as much of the kid like driving in school really stuff awesome as possible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then uh, did lots of like board games and stuff. I played Scrabble for the first time. I love Scrabble. In like decades, I hate it. <laughs> I, I was so spent mentally. Like my brain was like mush. See, I can pay attention to it. Scrabble. Like what I hate is like board games that you just sit and wait. But with Scrabble, yeah, you're, you're that's thinking kind of while someone else is doing your turn. True, true. Like during their turn, like, you know, it yeah. takes it takes me all that time to come up with something. For sure. Same here. Yeah. But I'm not the best with words. So like that and like Bananagrams and like any of these like Boggle, any of these like word type games, mm -hmm. you know, it. I can do it, but it feels like work oh yeah like it it like is hard like i can yes. only play like one of those games in this game you know i was teaching ellie how to play it but i didn't 
I haven't played it in decades. Oh, no, I'm definitely bad at it. So I was like looking at the rules. So here I am like reading rules and then doing grammar and like trying to, and I was just like, gosh, this is just, is this a game? This feels like torture. Um, I mean, it would be fun if I did it more and I was like better at it, but like neither Ellie or I was like super great at it. So we, all we had were like these short words. So we didn't have any room to connect anything. And I was like, oh, "Oh, this is just torturous. Yeah. Um, Anyway, it was still fun. I enjoyed that time with her, but we, so we played that, did some other board games and stuff too. We did some various video games. Um, Kids have been playing Sonic Frontiers, which is a pretty epic game. Um, And the music in that is awesome. It's like, hard rock which i'm very much into that's awesome so yeah that's pretty fun did some mario kart mario party all that kind of stuff get like the family stuff um i reorganized both of my sheds because i've been meaning to do that for forever and uh i didn't get completely through it all like i still want to do more but it's a kind of thing like i had i've had like some organization but it's sort of like if you have a closet or something like this is where your extra stuff goes into and you're like oh, i don't really have a place for this so like i'll just kind of put it there and then over time you're just like what is all this stuff oh yeah or you're like i have um i was trying to think what was it that we had we had like curtain rods like mm-hmm. spare curtain rods and brackets and stuff like that i think i found seven different places in our house with curtain rods with various curtain rod parts that had just been put into a little bin or a bag or like the little brackets all that and, stuff oh yes and i was like i just want to get all the curtain rod crap in one place so stuff like that that i was doing you know so it's like our guest closet my sheds uh my front room just those types of things like our wrapping paper so like this is a big time we get like all the kids christmas and birthday gifts and stuff like that so Rachel was on the ball. She like, just like ordered all that stuff. And I was like, great. I'm happy to not be involved in that. That was me um, this year. Yep. And, but it was like r- time to wrap it. I was like, let's go. I will wrap hard. So we got it like all knocked out, but we have wrapping paper that's like frozen and Thomas the tank engine and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, there's like the last like couple of feet on the tube. And you're, yeah. so we have all these like, tubes it's in a box that's too short so it's like in the guest closet with the tubes that are like sprawled all out like this and i'm like what are all these tubes like there's barely anything left like can we just use these up or get rid of them so like just purging some of that stuff because our kids are just beyond the point where that stuff is useful anymore um so yeah just cleaning through that stuff looking through old gift bags and you know the holiday decorations and stuff i was like rachel and i both look through the bins and we're like we got stuff that we inherited or whatever and i'm like we have not put this stuff out in a decade. Why are we storing this for like our kids to take? We don't even want it. It wasn't even wanted. It was, that's why it was given to us. Nobody wants it. So I was like, it's time to go. So just things like that was Good like for you. time to purge some it, stuff. Yeah. In our, in our <laughs> ornament, you know, Rubbermaid container thing, there are these two really creepy like porcelain mermaid ornaments that they look like little porcelain dolls. Oh. And every they've never made it to the tree. Wow. Every year we just take them out, look at how creepy they are, and put them back you in the bottom. Right in the, yeah. Shannon won't let me get rid of them because her grandparents gave it to her. Oh. I'm like, honey, they're not, they're never going to make it to three. Can we please? She's like, yeah. no. Oh but I'm gosh. like, you hate them. She's like, I know they're creepy, but no. I'm like, ah. Oh. Man, that's Every what year, happens. That's we just pull them out, laugh at them, and put them back. Yeah. We got plenty of that kind of stuff too. But like over time, you end up with like bins of stuff am, like that. I do not let guilt accumulate crap yeah, in you're, my you're, house. you're pretty good about that i there, i am not there have been times where that. i think we've talked about this where i've told you that shannon sometimes will say hey if this thing were no longer here i wouldn't be upset about it right, right. And i'm like loud and clear i honey. do that with rachel right yeah. and you did okay she'll yeah i'll be so, like I'll, she'll disappear i'll, I'll, I'll let her know yeah, yeah when it's like i i don't have the 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 uh determination yeah. or whatever to go through and sort this out and consciously get rid of it if you go through it and determine it's not something we need, yeah. just let it be. Yeah, that's me. I'm like, all right, <laughs> say fun. no more, honey. That's great. Consider consider it yeah. no longer existing. That's great. Yeah, so there was a lot of that mm-hmm. going on in the house. Good. Um, yeah, like clean out the garage. Feels good though, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Even just like the steps that we have going from our garage into our house. You know, like leaves and just like 
straw wrappers and just like little crap like that we just get under the steps and i can never quite reach it with the broom never could quite get it out and so it just had been piling under there for like years and i was like you know what i'm gonna like sweep all that out vacuum and like truly clean that area that i did because rachel spilled her coffee she like dropped her coffee and it went like everywhere and i was like it's time to like thoroughly clean this general area and now it's like when i walk into the house it's like ah there's not like tons of spider webs filled with old leaves i did have one moment like that last week i've been meaning to clean the filter on our vacuum Ooh, for yeah weeks. That's i finally good. did that yeah i was very very happy with myself filters there. yeah i spend a lot of time in my life managing filters you have a spreadsheet don't you I don't have a spreadsheet for all my filters. Oh, really? But I probably do. You have a subscription service for your home filters? I don't. Hmm. That's I what I don't do. Don't because I don't have like super. Sp- well, I have three different filters that I have to use in my house because mm-hmm. they're not like at the HVAC unit. They're like in the wall yeah. and ceiling and all that kind of stuff, and they're all different sizes. So that's fun. I just have one. But I just go and I buy like a year's worth at a time. That in sounds like, like one you. trip. And then because then I just like pile them up and I'm like, okay, they're just there and. I only have to remember, you know, when I get down to like two, I'm like, okay, let me buy some more at some point next time I'm at the store. And then I do, and I haven't run out, so I'm good. Actually, for some of those now, I bought um, washable filters now. Oh, So I'm just like, cool. I made the investment and I was like, That's you know, awesome. after so many years, it's like, it kind of makes more sense to wash, as long as you wash them out. Um, but I was like, yeah, I'm just going to do that. So, but I have that. Yeah, we have other filters. I mean, just the number of filters that we have in my life, it's... Like I think it's in the, like in the dozens, not even counting like small engines that have air filters and all that kind of stuff. Like so many filters, probably more filters than hammers in my life, honestly. Oh my! And that's saying a lot. And that's not fun. Hammers I, are fun. I did intend. I didn't. I wasn't able to accomplish this, but I did intend to gather up all my hammers, and actually like count them up and take a picture for the pencast here. And I didn't get enough of the sheds and stuff cleaned out to actually be able to do that, but it's on my mind. I Please intend do. to do that at some point. You know what I was looking for back here at some point? The That crazy, creepy hammer we got one time when we were demoing one of the old warehouses. Oh, I have that at home. You do? Good. Yeah. Oh, I do. Awesome. I didn't want it to disappear. Oh, it's crazy looking. Good. Okay. Yeah. I, just, I, just, I, I just didn't want... I wanted to make sure it wasn't gone. Oh, no. It's not gone. Good. It's there. Yeah. We call it like the zombie killer or something like that. Yeah. It really, but, um, it really does look like that. How often do you flush out your hot water tank? Oh, because you're supposed to do that every year. I just learned you're supposed to do that. And I have not done it since I moved in, which has been like three years. I mean, you're probably fine. Yeah, Um, but we we definitely have hard water, though. Like, I look at my coffee maker and it's like some white stuff in there. It would be be good to do. I know. I need to do that. Yeah. I mean, if you want to be kind of lazy about it, I do. um, You don't have to like probably fully flush the thing out. Okay. You can just like, because it's on the bottom, right? Yeah. Anything that settles out would be on the bottom. Yeah. So if you. Um, you know, connect a hose to it. Mm-hmm. You got to be careful because you don't want it to be like super hot. Yeah. Technically, you're supposed to like shut it off and wait for it to cool and then drain it. Yeah. But if you're not draining a ton of the water, you can just open it up, let it drain out. As long as you have like a place in your yard or whatever to let it drain out and it's not like in your basement or whatever, you know, you can let some water drain out. Like, I don't know, let it run for a couple of minutes enough to flush out stuff. And then any sediment that would be in the bottom, that would be the stuff that would get flushed out. Yeah. And then you just close it up and you're fine. You don't have to like fully flush out the whole tank. So So, there's videos on like how like you need to do it and then let it fill up again and do it again. Yeah, technically, I guess. Okay. But I I just need something's better than nothing. Yeah. You know, I should. But so I, I want to say that the water, because we had to replace our hot water heater after a while. And I thought, you know, because I hadn't been super great about doing that uh, with the one that we had previously. And it it was like an 11-year-old hot water heater when we bought the house. And it died a couple of years after that. So I was like, this thing's probably pretty bad. But I actually cut into it so I could see. And it wasn't that bad. Oh, okay. Um, but the new one that we have, I think, like, it fills the water from the bottom. or so. It's supposed to do something where it, like, doesn't have as much sediment buildup or okay. something. So I, actually, I probably need to replace mine soon anyway. I'm realizing I haven't actually flushed mine out. Well, great. I, I don't feel so bad it. anymore. Usually yeah. you're so much more ahead of home maintenance stuff than I am. I try to be, but it's just so much to keep track of. Oh, yeah. Though I will say, the first house Rachel and I bought, uh, that hot water here was probably 17 years old when we bought it. And it, uh, it died on us. And... In the process of trying to move it, I had to like, it was like copper pipe, you know, all that stuff in there. And it was like in the middle of our house, like under the stairs. 
So it was not in an easy place to drain or anything like that. So I cut the thing open. It had, I'm not joking, like three feet of sediment in the bottom of that thing. It was disgusting. Now they did not have, this was on well water and there was no kind of filtration system or anything on it. So as soon as that happened, I was like, we are getting a whole house water filter and a water softener and everything. So I installed all that stuff because oh. I saw the thing and I was like, this is so disgusting. <laughs> There's so much sediment in here. How did this thing even function? So yeah, it's real. If you, especially if you're on well water, yeah. you should definitely get that I'm, taken care of. I'm, done. I'm not on well water, but. Yeah, you're still. probably, I mean, yeah, stuff will still build up a little bit over time, but you're probably fine if it's been three years, you know, just do it and see if anything comes out of it. You can see like when you let the stuff out, like this, this you know, at, look at the end of the hose, you know, especially if you can like do it on your driveway or something I like probably that. probably will, yeah. You can see like there's like little sand and stuff like that. And if you do it and you're like, oh, there's like nothing here, then don't sweat it for another three years. Right. You know? Um, all right, let's see what else did I do. Um, mowed the lawn because it was like 65 degrees a couple of days this week. So I did that, um, went to the dump, you know, again, purging all this old crap, um, plus all the cardboard boxes from all the stuff that we ordered for Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, hung a lot of Christmas lights. Now we live in the boonies, so I didn't hang anything where anybody can see it. Just inside? Inside. Nice. So I like strung it up in our sunroom and I did, you know, like swinging lights, kind of like I did over here. I did That's swinging awesome. lights like all around our living room. Nice. And I, I got some lights for like the front of our little, like separate garage that we have. Um, they're called meteor lights. So they're like LEDs that like kind of stream yeah, down. They yeah, look yeah, kind of yeah. like look, look shooting star. Yeah, but they're, they're like rigid, rigid. They're rigid. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, yeah. So I've it's seen like those. LEDs. Yeah, they look like drips. Yes. Yeah, those are cool. And I installed those, and those are really cool. I was just like, yeah, I, I haven't, I had not bought Christmas lights in, I think, over a decade. That's awesome. So I was like, okay, I could buy a few lights this year and put them up, and it was just like very festive. So that was kind of cool. That's so awesome. I spent a lot of time up and down on ladders, um, short ladders, but still ladders. So did that. That was fun. Um, what else did I do? Put up our Christmas tree, purged a lot of unused Christmas decorations as well, because we have so many decorations that we've inherited from our childhoods and our kids and everything. And it was just like, we, we could like not even have a tree and just cover an object in ornaments and make it look like a tree, like with so many ornaments. And I was like, this is unnecessary. And some of it's like, they're not even that sentimental. It's just like crap that we did as a kid. And I'm like, this doesn't mean anything to me now. Yeah. Why do I even have this? Let's let's ditch it. So we we got rid of some of that stuff. And Very then cool. there's a lot of stuff that we didn't like truly throw away, but it was just like, I don't feel like putting a thousand ornaments on this tree. So it's like, kids, you put the ones that you want on there. Yeah. Rachel had some of her little target bird Christmas ornaments. So we put those on there. <laughs> and then that's pretty much it. We just left it very minimal this year. And Over the last couple of years, great. Hallmark has been making retro video game console ornaments. So the first, cool. first year they did a Super Nintendo. Second year they did a Sega Genesis. That's cool. This year they did a, a regular Nintendo. The little door opens. You know oh, how the cool. first yeah. Nintendo. Yeah. Oh, that's so and cool. they all play a song from, you know. Oh, that's cool. Like Super Mario World. Okay, that's Sonic neat. One, and then that's the first Mario. So I added yeah. an, I added a third console. Nice to the tree. That's fun. Yeah. No, that's fun. Um, one member of the house really likes pushing all of the musical ornaments oh, on the tree at, at once. the same time so you have video game music happening oh exciting you have the ghostbuster theme you have kermit Ooh. singing two songs okay you have han solo talking about tauntauns and rescuing luke skywalker wow it's a lot and archer just thinks it's hilarious mm. and shannon i don't need to tell you how shannon feels about that probably loves it i think definitely yeah, very supportive of it. <clears throat> um there you go. I uh, spent basically a whole day helping my parents hang some shelves around their place. So that was cool to be able to do that for them. Um, let's see here. I played the saxophone almost every day. Nice. I'm still keeping up with it. And I am can tell that I'm improving, which is encouraging. I heard something on sax this week. And I was like, ah, Brian needs to learn how to play that. And I can't think of what it was now. Mm, okay. I'll have to think. You think of it, let yeah, me know. I will. Yeah, I have some stuff that a lot, a lot of it I'm practicing like scales and like basic stuff, but um, you know, I'm practicing some of the like go to stuff that you kind of have to on sex, like Pink Panther nice. and Careless Whispers and stuff like that. Um, Living on a Prayer, I think I mentioned that I'm practicing that one. That one's pretty good. Take Five, you know, some like the standby, like jazz type stuff. Blue Christmas, the jazzy version, like Michael Buble version. I'm doing that. I can rock out pretty hard to that. So it's fun. Yeah. And I'm, I'm playing like the intermediate to intermediate advanced stuff now. 
So it's like, it's, it's come back pretty quick. It's still um, in your closet. It's pretty fun. Still in the closet. Yep. I'll, I'll take it outside the closet every now and then. Nice. But still mostly staying in there, but yep. So that's pretty fun. Enjoying that. Um, also rode my bike several times. I've not been riding it as much recently, but, um, had a friend who works out of his house who lives like maybe close to three miles away. So I was like, you want to like go for a lunchtime bike ride or something? So I like rode my bike to his house. We rode around and I rode back. So I actually ended up riding my bike four days last week. So yeah, back in the saddle. And now I'm like, the weather's crappy and awful now. I'm super cold. So I'm like, great time for me to get inspired to re-ride my bike again. But um, I have a little like trainer thing that you put on the back wheel and you can put your bike inside and ride it like an exercise bike. Um, so I'm doing that now. And I'm Getting into a routine at night of uh, playing Bloons CD6 because they had an update last week that was pretty nice. epic. So I can play Bloons while I'm biking inside. That's and I'm cool. like, this is better than me just like sitting on the couch yeah. playing that game because you're kind of, it's not a game that you're like actively doing all the time. It's a tower defense game. So you're like doing stuff here and there. So it's like, I can be biking and then just like every now and then move a thing around. It's like, cool, I'm getting to relax and also do the opposite of relax at the same time. So that was pretty fun. Um, and then my big project that I was kind of impulsive is I, I started another log grave. It was kind of on accident. So I, explain. <laughs> so this is what happens when, how do you make an accidental this log is, grave? This is what happens when I have, when I have time on my hands. So it, it started out with, you know, I have a big pile of what was previously mulch that I'm slowly letting turn into compost. So like all of our food waste. By choice, kind of right? Not yeah, because yeah, by you choice, by choice. couldn't figure out what to do with your no, no, no. mulch. Yeah, well, I mean, part, but a little of both. Um, <laughs> so I have a compost pile that's like, I don't know, probably, you know, 20 yards worth of 20 cubic yards, which is like a dump truck full. Um, is it like it's in, a huge... enclosed in some sort of... No, it's just out there is in this the a elements. pile? Yeah, it's a pile. Okay. No, that's how you do... Com yeah, compost works like that. You get a big enough pile and, you know, you got to turn the pile every now and then, which I do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's like it's, it's slowly turning into some very rich nutrient soil. Um, but, yeah, so I was just like I needed to... I needed to get rid of the compost, so... I'll often go and I've got a tractor and I'll like go and lift up and I'll dump the stuff kind of in the bottom and put the pile back on top. Mm -hmm. So I was like churning the pile and all that kind of stuff, but just like where I have it situated back there, it was like, I have to kind of go around it all the time. And I was like, why don't I just like put it back like closer to the edge of the woods and then I'll have to like go around it and all this kind of stuff. So I can't really explain it too much, but um, cause it doesn't make any sense and it's really boring. Mm -hmm. But I was just like, um, let me move the pile. But I kind of didn't really remember, but like I had, really kind of dug the compost pile like down into the dirt um, so that it would like be more moist and stuff like that. So I did that a while ago. So as I was moving the pile, I, would, I kept digging down. I was like, man, there's like more and more compost here. So I kind of started digging a big hole right where that compost pile was, which was like right next to where the old log grave was that <laughs> still had like the not quite like uh, planted grass and stuff like that that was there. So I was like, I have like already pretty disturbed soil. I have this compost pile that I just moved that's now a giant muddy hole. And I'm like in the tractor and I'm like, I have a pile of logs that I haven't buried yet. And I'm like, well, I could just like start a log grave right now. And it just would, and it was super nice weather. So, so I was you like, literally realize I have a hole now. I have some I, logs. I, I had literally started a log hole and I was like, well, I guess I might as well just kind of do this. Let's put those logs in this hole Let's I just made. Hole. Yeah. You didn't make the hole on purpose. You were just trying to scoop the I didn't start the hole on pur purpose, but then I was like, well, let me go ahead and make this another. You have to fill it in with something. Make this another log grave. So I that's what I did. So I haven't actually put anything in it yet. But this one I was like cuz I remember when I did the last one, I could do like two logs deep. So it ended up being like really long, but not not but so deep. So and I remember thinking when I made the last one, I was like, why didn't I just go deeper? And then I remembered like, oh yeah, because it's like hard clay. Yeah. It's like a rock. But then I have this thing called a, a piranha tooth bar that goes onto the bucket. That's this like jagged, mangly looking steel that's like probably three quarters of an inch thick. That's like sharp and jutted. That's made for like digging into like piles of gravel and like hard clay and stuff like that. And I hadn't put it quite to the test as much as I did on this thing. And it does a pretty bang up job of digging into that clay. So I was like, Let's go. So that hole's about six feet deep right now. And it's probably about 30 feet long. 
maybe. So I'm digging quite the grave for my logs. So I'm gonna be able to fit a lot of logs in there. So <laughs> yeah, because I anticipate like this is the time of year where it's really good to take trees down too, because the sap's not running up and you know, there's not as many leaves and stuff like that. So it's like a good time to take trees down and cool. have it a lot of uh, my eye on a lot of trees. The hole that you accidentally made by moving the compost yeah. was probably something you could have filled in. Oh yeah. But instead I could have easily filled you that in. D dug a 30 foot yeah. wide, six foot deep yeah. pit. The whole thing's not six feet deep because I got to be able to get the tractor in and out. So it's like on a ramp sort of, but it's, it's like six a pool. feet and then I'm going to dig. Yeah, it's, it's like digging. I could dig a swimming pool if I wanted to. I've thought about it, believe me, but no. <laughs> um, so anyway, that was my that was my one kind Would, of wild Wouldn't it have been project. faster to just kind of like scoop more earth on top of it and then yeah. put the logs back into the woods? Yeah. As, after I dug the hole, I was like, why did I do this? <laughs> I don't, We've had this I don't have to bury the logs. Before. I don't have to bury the logs underground. I think I just really wanted to dig a hole. <laughs> it was just kind of fun. <laughs> That's a problem with having a tractor is you start you projects because you're like, I got the equipment. And you realize, well, I could just leave it this deep, but I also have that attachment that could really mangle some I know. clay. Let, Let me, me do see that. how well this does <laughs> in hard play. Just with your toys. Yeah, kind of. That's, that's kind of what it was. Yeah, when I was I a kid it. and you had like Tonka toys and yes. construction stuff, you're like, man, it'd be so fun to work with construction equipment. And then you get older and you do, and you're like, this is every bit as fun as I thought it would oh be as a kid. Gosh. So I was like a little kid out there just digging giant holes. This is amazing. So, but do you remember I, when, when, you, when we were kids, you'd go to like a you know, random playground and every now and then mm -hmm. the playground would have one of those like, you know, hand, you oh, know, yeah. like a little, yeah, a little scooper thing. thing. Oh, those were so cool. Yeah. You know what's even cooler than that? An actual one? Hydraulics. <laughs> so you have just like, it's like yes. a video game. It's like joysticks. <laughs> yeah. And as you're moving it, the like hydraulics are moving and it's like bucking you around and you're yeah. just like, oh, this is so awesome. I was, so, I let Archer fly my fun. drone uh, a couple of weeks ago and he was like really nervous oh, yeah? and freaking out about it. But like, dude, it's just like a video game. And I put the controller in his hand. Yeah. And he's like, oh, yeah. And he's like, so easy, yeah, right? It's, it's just, just so natural. Yeah. Um, I did take a picture that I can share on here, um, but I'll at least show you um, what's going oh on. Oh my God. So you can see how big it is. So that's a shovel. Oh my God. You can see how God. deep it is. And then the pile of what I've dug out is this massive pile of dirt now. And I'm like, Brian, what have I like, done? So there's the, there's like the a, compost pile that I moved. Oh my God. Yeah. This hole is like three times the depth of that whole compost pile. You could bury a car probably in this thing. It looks like a, a, a loading ramp to like a... It's what it is. Oh my God. I made my own loading ramp so that I can put logs in there and then bury them. What's wrong with me? I, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, I... I had to do, I had to do something. You did something. I had to do like some like project because I was like organizing and cleaning and hanging light. And I was like, I gotta do something that's like, you know. <laughs> moving my body a little oh bit. Oh my goodness. So that's what I did. I, I left it at that and I was like, okay, that like got enough out of my system and and there we go. So I'll keep you updated on my log grave 2.0 adventures. Please, please, please do. That, that happened. I want to see a picture of it with the logs in there. I want to see your log arrangement. I will strategy. try to do a better job of photographing it as I go. Cause I, <laughs> at, I, I, I realized after I did the last one, like I didn't do as good a job cataloging the whole process. <laughs> so I'll try to, I'll try to do that. This Thank time. you. Yes. Cause I know you all care so much. I, I'm, it is interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> it is interesting. Uh, Rachel finds it interesting. Let me tell you, she's like, that's quite a pile you've uh, <laughs> got going on there. Cause all the dirt that I removed, I had to put. Oh, Brian made another pile. On top of this, so, yeah. He's got a different pile. He's got a pile. Just, I was just thinking as I moved the compost pile, I was like, wow, that like dirt pile from the previous log grave is like, it's really gotten pretty small. Cause I've used it to patch up different parts You could of have the yard. used that to patch the hole from. Oh, absolutely could have. <laughs> I could have it just looking totally normal back there now. <laughs> Rachel could look out and just be like, this just is a normal yard. So you've got three piles. Now it looks like a construction site. Yeah. Yep. Nice. I love it. I, oh. I can't justify it. <laughs> it's just what happened. Anyway, that's my life. Mm. Keep you all updated as things go. Um, we got company updates and then we'll wrap it up. <sighs> all right. Well, I do have an update on shipping deadlines, Drew, for the holidays. Yeah, you go first. I've got something too. Yeah, they've already passed, so it's too <laughs> late. Um, at, at least for like the the slowest economical shipping. Yeah. Um, so you know, obviously, like Christmas is fast approaching. 
um, will be open and shipping uh, through the 22nd. So, you know, especially if you're nearby, there's a good chance you'll probably get it. But if you like need it in time for Christmas, at this point, you're going to have to use the expedited stuff, FedEx two day or express or something like that. So yeah, I will say that if yeah. you happen to be in the state of Virginia where we're located, it's no longer a one day delivery. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. We ship, we ship exclusively with DHL now. So mm -hmm. their yeah, you know, they, nearest they, processing center, I think is in North Carolina. So things will need to exit Virginia to come back to Virginia. Yeah. And then they hand it off to USPS yeah. for the last mile. So it's, it takes a little bit longer, but it's cheaper so we yeah. can do more free shipping options and stuff so just take that into account we were also able to eliminate the uh dollar minimum for the uk i don't think we mentioned that uh on the pencast yet uh, i don't think we mentioned on the pencast i know we did some emails and stuff yeah. like that so just in case uh you still think you can't order from us and i will say this is a very technical thing so i won't get super deep into it but we we had um the for the customs and stuff so we have um where you like pay customs and duties yeah now so that's still fine it's always more complicated than you think but we are we were definitely having some issues with the localized currencies yeah we've rolled that back for the time being because there were so many bugs and so many weird circumstances with things like buying gift cards and you know when there was a shipping address that was you know different than your ip address and like all these types of things um, it created a lot of complications and the currency was not like real time currency. So <clears throat> things like returns and stuff like that, it just got, it got really complicated. So we've rolled it back a little bit. We're trying to work through some stuff. Yeah, so, we'll bring it back, but yeah, it was a cool feature. You could go, to, you could go to the bottom of our website and change the currency to your country's currency. Yeah. But, um, for now it's disabled. It's back yeah. to USD, but yeah. So the, the custom stuff is all still there. So you can still do the duties prepaid and all that kind of stuff. But the local currency thing is, is, it wasn't as seamless as what we had thought. And yeah, we certainly testing. don't want to make things more confusing for you. Yeah. So anyway, um, you can always reach out to our team, info at gulatevents.com if you have questions about any of that stuff. Um, and then we had uh, something that was just announced this week. So we had applied for something called Best in Biz. Um, so best in biz, it's sort of like a great place to work, or we've done like small giants. We've done several of these type of recognition award type things. Um, we've had like the Newsweek, you know, e-com, top e-com sites and stuff like that. That one just happens. We don't apply for that one. Um, this is one that we applied for, um, for best in biz. So best in biz is the only independent business awards program. So it's not actually done by like Forbes or Newsweek or anything like that. Those are all like sponsored by a news organization and then they're like asking you to buy ads for their stuff. And it's always kind of like, what's this all about? Kind of thing. And you're always kind of like in question, but this one is like, they work with like prominent editors and reporters from things like Associated Press and Wall Street Journal and stuff like that. So they are essentially like judges and they make determinations. We didn't have to do like a team survey or any of this type of stuff. They're looking at various metrics. They're looking at kind of objective things, um, but they essentially decide like, who gets these awards. Um, we had applied for this thing like in April or something like that. So we had to tell them all our story and all this kind of stuff. Um, but we just found out this week that we won two awards from them, which is pretty dang exciting. Uh, we won a gold place award for the most customer friendly company of the year in their small business category, which is pretty awesome. So that's not just like customer service that it takes into account, but it's like user friendliness of the website and focus on education and, you know, service and, you know, support with like shipping, all that kind of stuff. So it like really is kind of like for what we do, it's kind of like, like what we are all driving towards every day. That's so our to goal. Get, to get recognized for that is like pretty awesome. You're doing good at the thing you're trying to do. Yay. Yay. Um, and then we also won a silver award for the website of the year, which is pretty awesome. And if you look at like who's won these things in years past, it's like Fidelity, Lowe's, Moody's. It's like real companies and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool to be so like- So we're a real company? I, 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 I was kind of joking with, you know, like with, with Jen, our, our HR director, I was like, I feel like, how do they even take us seriously when we apply to these <laughs> things? And we're just like such a nobody kind of a company like compared to some of these other companies and stuff like that. But- um, They don't know that. Cool. Well, they do now because they like do their research and they, you know, look at all the stuff. So um, that's kind of cool. So they have bestinbizawards.com. Um, I think it was just announced on Wednesday, uh, all the officials. So I don't, I don't know where we fall into anything else. And this is a new thing we've never like applied for before. So it's like, 
you know, at, we're recording this on Tuesday, so we got a little bit of a heads up. So it will be published by the time this video goes out. So there may be more information I find out about it once it actually goes public. But there you go. It's kind of fun. And I'm super proud of our team and super proud of our company. So it's pretty rad. All right. I think that's it for company updates. I think we have some videos and stuff that we've done, but you'll see those. We'll talk about more of those. Yeah, I'll probably soon. do a what's new video, but that'll yeah. be published by the time this goes that out. It'll already happen. Yeah. All right. We're ready to wrap this thing up. We've had a nice long one. So made up for lost time. <laughs> All right, Drew. I want to thank everybody for watching. Ask them for feedback. Ask you for feedback. Um, and then, you know, keep asking questions. We have not answered every pen question. So I think I might have answered every paper question. Yes, please know. ask more pen <laughs> questions so we don't have to talk about paper ever again. Oh, my gosh. Check out goodlypens.com for fountain pen ink paper needs, blah, blah, blah. And I got a fun fact. You found a fun fact? I found one. When did you do that? I found it while you were talking uh, about something. How about that? Pro some of the products, I think. Um, so the first artificial Christmas tree wasn't actually a tree at all. It was created out of goose feathers that were dyed green. First artificial Christmas trees were developed in Germany in the 19th century due to a major continuous deforestation. The feather trees became increasingly popular during the 20th century and finally made their way to the U.S., though I'm sure that also created a defeatheration. So there's only so many feathers. In fact, wasn't that a thing? Not related to the trees at all. But I think that, okay, hang on. I've got some synapses that are connecting here. So there is uh, an, uh, uh, a regulatory body I can't remember exactly what it is, but um, CITES. It, it's a like federation, S, perhaps? Like C-I-T-E-S. Um, so they're the regulatory body. The reason I know about them is because they're the ones that regulate things like um, wood and like lumber and stuff like that, and which like woods are endangered and that type of thing for like lumber harvesting and stuff. Um, but that's actually not why they were created. The reason that CITES was created as an organization was because I think it's in the early 20th century, there were so many people that were wearing hats, like the big hats mm -hmm. that had all kinds of like goose feathers and all kinds of like natural feather hats that there was like a major problem with um, like birds, like they were endangering birds because these hats were getting so big and elaborate that they were like killing off these like endangered birds or plucking them or whatever it was like causing harm to these birds so they like created this like regulatory body for like various like flora fauna you know these types of things um to help to regulate these things and like a big catalyst for that was because of like the feathers that people were using for their elaborate hats and that turned into the wood and then, thing and the wood thing about. yeah and then the wood thing also kind huh. of got into there and yeah isn't that crazy Look at that. You had a fun fact and you didn't even know it. You had a bonus fun fact. There we here. go. So it just made me think of it because we were talking about trees and feathers. And I was like, oh, yeah, there's like a also a tie into all that stuff. So the past is crazy. But anyway, can you imagine like a goose feather Christmas tree? It's kind no. of crazy, right? No. I have a friend who still has one of those like old school aluminum uh, trees that, oh, really? had, that are in a, it's in a little rotating base. Oh, interesting. With one of the little the light that has like the rotating, you know, kaleidoscope of colors. Like that a full size tree? Or is it like a tabletop thing? No, no, it's a full size tree. Yeah. Wow. It's like the, the ones they were making fun of at Charlie Brown. I was you know? thinking that's the only, yeah. I've never actually seen an aluminum tree in real it's life. It's not as full as you might think. It's pretty sparse. Right. But um, yeah, it's one of the, it's an antique, you know. Wow. It's pretty cool. Do you have to like store it as like a whole tree or does it like fold up? I don't, or don't know. know. I don't like, know. I've only ever seen it completely set up. Some someone you know probably. I've only ever seen it in cartoon. Form yeah, no. On some, Charlie some, Brown. some somebody a couple <laughs> generations ahead of us might need to answer that question. There you go. So, another fun fact, bonus one. Vince, oh. Vince Guaraldi, because I'm listening to a lot of that. Who? He, Vince Guaraldi. He's a guy that composed Linus and Lucy and like all the Peanuts. Oh. Soundtrack and stuff. So Vince Guaraldi Trio. That's like, you know, everything from the Charlie Brown Christmas. I thought Schroeder did it all. No. What? No, not at all. What a fraud. No, it was all Vince Guaraldi. But oh, my gosh. He, uh, yeah, he, he's the one that came up with basically all the Peanuts music. Um, and he was originally commissioned to do that. And he came up with Linus and Lucy, like the Peanuts song. Didn't know that that was going to be like the main theme. But he just like got inspired and created that. And that became the running theme and um, all that kind of stuff. So that was really cool. And he was like just a really cool, good guy. 
Um, and like in some of the later stuff where he like sings like little birdie, you know, like that, that type of songs and like some of the later peanut stuff that was actually him singing too. I was like, that's so cool. Good guy. Anyway. And fun fact, we're just in bonus fact, like overload here for the like Charlie Brown Christmas. Cause that was like the first peanuts thing on TV was Charlie Brown Christmas. So that like kicked it off. Of course they did all kinds of stuff after that. Um, they, you know, part of what was so controversial about it at the time is they used real children to do those voices. So it's like five-year-olds and stuff that are actually doing the voices of those kids, which part of the reason why it sounds a little choppy, you know, because it's like, it sounds a little kind of like disjointed yeah. when they're talking. All I want is my fair share. Yeah. Yeah. It's because they were using real like young kids mm -hmm. to do these voices. The kids couldn't like memorize a line. So they had to like, feed the line like one at a time to the yeah. kids and record it and then kind of like chop it all together. And that just kind of became part of like the Peanuts charm. And so they just kind of ran with it. How about that? So isn't that wild? I did not know that. I didn't know that either. I mean, I guess it makes but, sense. I listened yeah. to them like they don't, it sounds I knew they, legit. Yeah, you're like, these don't sound like yeah. <laughs> professionals, but it was just kind of neat. So yeah. It yeah. is choppy. Yeah, it is kind of yeah. choppy, but that like became part of the kind like of Like Lin Linus's, you know, Christmas speech, you yeah. know. Is very segmented. It's, it sounds very segmented yeah. because they like literally just, yeah. you, you can imagine as an adult, like trying to get your kid to say something and you're just like, you could get like five words at a time and they would just record it and then they like splice it all together. I'll tell you what, there was like a two year old actress in the new Godzilla movie. She was fantastic. Yeah? It was kind of freaky because in, in wow. movies you see it's like either a baby or like a five year old. Right. In between is just kind of not a thing, but wow. it was kind of crazy. I'm like, is she CG? Cause she's like acting. Cause <laughs> right. wow. Wow. How anyway. That? Anyway. This might be one? a new record. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Well, there's our, our seasonal gift to you all. Um, hope you all have enjoyed this one. We will catch you, I think, next week, right? We're, we're, That's the plan. We're here for a while. Yeah. And because of where Christmas is going to fall, I think we're going to just keep be able to keep rolling. We have no, no plans for taking good, any more so. time off. There you go. Anyway, more of us. Yay. Thanks for watching, everybody. And bye.